Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Charlie Staley. I'm the um, Chief of Surgical Oncology and the Chief Quality Officer of the Winship Cancer Institute. And I would uh, like to welcome everyone to the 10th Annual Winship Gastrointestinal Cancer Virtual Symposium. I would certainly want to thank all the course directors for all their time that they put into organizing this meeting. Dr. Elise Patel, Shah, Sha, Shaib, and Wu. Uh, thank our, our invited faculty, uh, Dr. Bakay Saab and Dr. George, and, uh, and also thank uh, the Emory faculty speakers who, again, have put a lot of time into this. And then always importantly, especially in these days where I said to the people before, it's, this, this is more of a technical challenge than, than many times getting the content right so I'd like to thank the CME staff and Melini Mingo in, in really helping to get this going from a technical aspect in, a, in an age of pandemic that we do things very differently. Um, I wanted to, uh, in this introduction, wanted to sort of highlight, um, I've been on, at Emory and, and practicing GI surgical oncology over the last 26 years and uh, would like to maybe start off with what I think is a, an encouraging and uh, upbeat case presentation that I don't think I would have seen at the beginning of my career. And it actually happens to be a good friend of mine who called me one day, he's 57 years old, he had some vague abdominal pain, went to the ER, they did an ultrasound on him and found that he had um, a pancreatic mass. And uh, he had a CT scan done uh, which, as I'll scroll through this, you can see he did not have any liver metastases. But when you get down to the pancreas, you'll start seeing some ductal dilatation in the tail of the pancreas. And then when you get down to what we call the uncinate process of the pancreas, what you'll see here is this large mass in the uncinate process of the pancreas with this spiromesenteric artery surrounded by this tumor and horrible compression of the spiromesenteric vein. This is a slide that I would have had uh, in my slide deck showing what an unresectable pancreas cancer, and in fact, a pancreas cancer that would probably never go on to get any sort of surgical resection. Um, he was seen by our multidisciplinary team uh, here at Emory and um, had a biopsy which showed adenocarcinoma. Uh, he then went on to um, aggressive uh, chemotherapy with fulfurinox uh, over four months and interestingly developed duodenal obstruction and ended up needing a duodenal stent. Um, and after his... Um, his, his four months of chemotherapy, um, he underwent this rescan, which you'll be able to see as we get down to the same levels, there's been a dramatic decrease um, in the tumor. We're now down to what looks like nice enhancing pancreas and this residual mass back here, you can see that the, the, the compression on the artery has lessened. And now you can actually see a a fairly patent um, portal vein here. So dramatically decreased in size. Uh, we presented our tumor board and went on to uh, get uh, chemo radiation, uh, at which time uh, he then underwent this follow-up scan, which showed a lot of haziness from, um, from the chemo radiation, the local uh, deal. but. As you can see by this scan, really, this was about all that was left. And you can sort of get a sense that there's a plane here. But, but this is something that we really face these days with people who have had great responses is, is this tissue representing dead tumor or is it representing um, persistent disease? So the story goes on that... Um, he uh, was taken to the operating room and underwent a Whipple resection. Um, and on the specimen, he had only a two millimeter 
uh, residual focus of adenocarcinoma. He had 21 negative lymph nodes. His margins were negative. And five years later, he uh, is retired on his sailboat in Key West. So it clearly points out that we have made some success in some of these tumors. This doesn't represent something that happens in every pancreas patient, but this was clearly, if you looked at his first scan, you would have never predicted the outcome of this scan and of, of this patient. And so I think today we're, we have um, some great talks on real-time challenge that we face clinically each day for all of us, whether it's medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, or surgical oncologists. I think there'll be some great discussion about how we sequence um, different modes of modality in treatments of cancer. Certainly, we've evolved significantly where genomics and ctDNA is becoming uh, part of our strategy at determining personalized cancer treatment. I think there's been continued evolution of novel neoadjuvant therapies, and hopefully Dr. Mathel will, will showcase uh, his hard-fought uh, first in the United States uh, neoadjuvant trial for incidental gallbladder, which has just been activated through the cooperative groups. Uh, I think we're going to have some great, a great talk on the expanded role of immunotherapy in upper GI cancers. And then finally, later in the day, um, novel discussion of novel treatment strategies, uh, looking at uh, PRT for neuroendocrine tumors. So I think we have a great day of, um, of, of very pertinent talks to things that we, we face every day. And again, I want to thank everyone for coming this morning for a virtual symposium. And with that, I'll, I'll move it over to uh, uh, the first speaker. Thank you everyone for being here today with us. I'm uh, honored and privileged to share the podium with Dr. Tom George, who's a medical oncologist from the University of Florida and is uh, one of the PIs for the TNT trials. Uh, and my name is Dr. Glenn Balch. I'm a surgical oncologist and colorectal surgeon here at Emory. And we're gonna have a debate today regarding the uh, total neoadjuvant treatment for or total neoadjuvant therapy for the treatment of stage two and three rectal cancer patients. As most of you know, the, the standard of care for stage two and three rectal cancer treatment has been, uh, since the 1990s, has been neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy followed by surgical resection and then adjuvant systemic chemotherapy. But I think one thing that we can all agree on is there's that we have a lot of room for improvement in the treatment of rectal cancer. First of all, most survivors, survivors experience significant impairment in function and quality of life. 20 to 30% die from metastatic disease. 30% never start systemic chemotherapy adjuvantly and less than half complete systemic uh, chemotherapy regimens. So there's an impetus for change such as the total neoadjuvant therapy pro protocols. So I'm gonna let uh, Dr. George start with the pros uh, for TNT, and then I will follow with the arguments against TNT. Great. Thanks, Dr. Balsh, and uh, thanks for the organizing committee at uh, Winship for uh, allowing me the opportunity to participate today. Um, we've got uh, five different uh, points that we want to make in comparison of the uh, pros and cons for uh, for utilization of uh, total neoadjuvant therapy. And the first one being that the, the pros of TNT are that uh, you can see uh, better or higher treatment responses uh, that lead to uh, complete response rates, uh, but the con uh, being that uh, we're uh, uh, over-treating uh, some patients. So before we get started with uh, uh, with a lot of details, I uh, wanted to just make sure that we were all kind of uh, on the same page with terminology. 
uh, total neoadjuvant therapy relates to the uh, inclusion of uh, all uh, modalities of therapy that would normally be given for a patient with uh, rectal cancer uh, in a preoperative setting. So they all end with surgery. Uh, and the two flavors of uh, total neoadjuvant therapy uh, uh, are really based on the sequence of therapy, whether uh, we start with chemotherapy followed by radiation or start with radiation followed by chemotherapy. And this, uh, the, the, this uh, distinction between these two sequences uh, may become relevant uh, later in the, in the debate and discussions. So compared to our historical approach, as Dr. Balsh had alluded to, where we uh, lead with chemo radiation and then go to surgery, uh, trying to deliver uh, post-operative therapy, we know that uh, complete clinical response rates uh, can be achieved uh, at the time of surgery, approximately 20 to 30% of patients. So a complete clinical response rate means essentially that we just don't see, feel, or uh, can find the cancer uh, before surgery is undertaken. Uh, but we know that uh, cancer is still present in some of those patients, only about 75% uh, of them, or three and four, uh, will actually have sterilization of the cancer, and that's what's represented by a pathologic complete response rate. Now, when we incorporate total neoadjuvant therapy and we deliver all of our therapy up front, we can see the, uh, the clinical complete response rates uh, nearly double, uh, up to approximately 50%, uh, and uh, at least half of those, if not slightly more, uh, actually have complete sterilization of the cancer. And it's possible that and data is starting to emerge that the sequence of who goes first, whether it's radiation or chemotherapy, may impact uh, these uh, these response rates to some degree, uh, as we will uh, as we will get into a little bit so later. Thank you, Dr. George. And as we talk about TNT specifically, one concern is that we may over-treat certain patients, especially stage two patients and those that have had a complete or near complete response to therapy. So when we consider over treatment of patients when adopting TNT, two questions arise. One, is there if there is no clear benefit to adding adjuvant therapy in the older regimen, will there be a survival benefit benefit to simply moving chemotherapy to the preoperative period? And the second question is, are we adding chemo chemotherapy with questionable benefit at the expense of more toxicity? As most of you know, uh, it, patients that are treated with Folfox, about 30 to 40 percent will experience, experience grade three or four toxicity, and another 10 to 15 percent will experience significant neurotoxicity. So there are a lot of problems with rectal cancer trials, as we will discuss, but one issue is there's no cl clear risk stratification in the treatment protocols. Survival is better for no negative patients and complete responders to preoperative therapy. So why do we treat them the same as a stage three patient? There are four randomized controlled trials evaluating survival of rectal cancer patients with the addition of adjuvant therapy. Now, each of these trials have problems, but there is no confirmed survival benefit, especially in stage two patients in these four randomized control trials. As for Folfox or KPOX, a meta-analysis showed no survival benefit for stage two patients treated with preoperative chemoradiation therapy followed by adjuvant Folfox or KPOX. So again, do we need both chemoradiation therapy and Folfox or Folfiri uh, preoperatively, especially if there's no clear benefit to giving these therapies adjuvantly? And would we be over-treating certain groups of patients and exposing them to more toxicity? One of the studies I wanted to focus on is this ER, ER, sorry, EORTC 22921 trial that specifically looks at stage two patients. Um, treated with preoperative radiation therapy, followed by surgical resection, and then uh, plus or minus adjuvant 5-FU. This is a randomized controlled trial, and there were 1,100 patients. And you can see by the survival graphs and the tables that there were no significant improvement in survival at five or 10 years. Again, I realize this is not modern day adjuvant chemotherapy, only 5-FU, but in no negative patients, we don't know if adding more uh, toxic chemo is the answer in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting.
The other group of patients that could be overtreated with a TNT approach is the complete or near complete responders. And one problem, as we will discuss, is it's hard to identify if patients have had a complete response. We know that patients treated with uh, preoperative chemo radiation therapy have a pathologic complete response uh, or, or and have a complete pathological response, they have a approximately 90% five-year survival. So why would adding more chemo improve the survival in these patients? This is the Chronicle study from the United Kingdom looking at stage two and three patients treated with preoperative chemo radiation followed by surgical resection and then randomized to either op or Zlox therapy adjuvantly. And now this is not a great study, uh, but I bring this study to your attention for a few reasons. One, there is no improvement in survival between the two groups, um, as you can see by the charts and the graphs here. However, this was a study that was closed due to the lack of accrual at uh, only 116 patients, so low powered, and only about 50% of patients actually received the adjuvant chemo. So. The other thing I wanted to, you to take notice is the chemo group had about 15% of patients that were T0 uh, and 82% that were N0 patients um, after their surgical specimen was examined. In the observation group, there was only 2% that were T0 and 52% that were N0. So there were more complete responders and no negative patients in the chemotherapy group despite the randomizations. But the question is, here is, would there have been a survival benefit if these patients had been stratified by response to chemo radiation therapy? And of course, uh, the uh, low number of patients did not help the study at all. So uh, what about toxicity? Uh, this is some snapshots from the NCI website uh, regarding the number of patients that experienced toxicities from full fox therapy. These are some of the common side effects that can be seen in 20 and up to 100% of patients. Um, and I'm just gonna just name off a few of these very quickly, hand and foot syndrome, uh, diarrhea, difficulty swallowing, um, numbness, tingling, pain, um, and paresthesias. Uh, these are significant toxicities uh, that are common. Then when you look at uh, some of the occasional toxicities that can be experienced by four to 20% of patients, uh, again, significant toxicities include chest pain, um, abnormal heart rates, um, abnormal body movement, um, blurred vision, swallowing of the body, um, dehydration, uh, uh, kidney um, dysfunction, um, just some of the, some of the, less common but still significant toxicities and when you look at rare and serious uh, toxicities damage to the heart uh, a new cancer resulting from treatment and stephen johnson syndrome again these are rare but again i just wanted to remind everyone of the significant toxicities that can occur all right thanks dr balsh so the uh the next point uh, that we want to discuss is uh related to uh uh, the, the pro of total neoadjuvant therapy is that uh, we're delivering treatment with an intact microenvironment and vasculature that, that's as of yet undisrupted by surgery. Uh, whereas the, the con is that uh, maybe more chemo is not necessary, but perhaps more time following radiation is the, is the key variable to consider. So I just want to go back to kind of therapeutic physiology of, uh, of, of cancer management. And uh, when it comes to medical oncology and we're delivering systemic therapy, um, you know, the bioavailability of therapy, whether it's given in an oral or intravenous manner, um, is, uh, is all related to uh, achieving systemic concentration. And that systemic concentration then uh, corresponds with tissue and tumor concentration uh, via a blood distribution uh, so that uh, tissue penetration uh, is affected by having an intact vasculature and any peritumoral edema uh, that may have uh, may have occurred. 
And similarly, for radiation, uh, regardless of the particles involved uh, in the emission of the radio uh, radioisotopes, um, you can get direct effects against DNA uh, from those particles uh, in damaging uh, damaging the, the double helix directly. But there's an important consideration that the indirect effect of ionizing radiation uh, requires water and oxygen being present in the tumor tissue such that uh, you can create free radicals, which uh, can do as much, if not more, damage than the uh, than the original particles directly themselves. And then lastly, you know, we're, I think we're all uh, realizing the uh, critical nature of, uh, of the tumor microenvironment uh, with uh, supporting stroma and uh, structural uh, support elements that are uh, really important for uh, immunogenic uh, presentation, uh, recognition, and activation uh, of the immune system. So if we ever really hope to have colorectal cancer become a, uh, a hot tumor from an immunogenic standpoint, whereby we can uh, utilize uh, the immune system to, to work on our behalf, we really do need uh, the, the microenvironment to be uh, as intact as is possible for this interplay uh, to, to, be, uh, to be functional for our patients. Great points, Dr. George. So as I mentioned, we know that if a patient has a pathologic complete response, their survival is greater than 90%. So really our ultimate goal is for a pathologic complete response. Uh, and which happens, as Dr. George mentioned, in up to 20 to 30 percent of patients. But the question is, do we need more chemo to get a higher pathologic complete response? And we know that DNA is damaged during radiation. And as Dr. George mentioned, the indirect effects and in cell lysis that can occur takes several weeks. So it makes sense that the longer we wait, uh, the more tumor dies. So. It used to be that surgical resection was done within four to six weeks uh, or even earlier in some surgeons' hands due to a theoretical concern for increase in fibrosis leading to more difficult um, operation and more post-operative complications. This is still a, a belief that is held by many surgeons today. However, recent data that I listed here shows that just by increasing the interval to greater than eight weeks between preoperative chemo, chemo radiation and the time to resection significantly increases the pathological complete response rate um, up to 30 percent in some of these studies so this is done without an increase in operative time or higher post-operative complications thus it debunks the concern that waiting leads to more fibrosis and a more difficult operation so Maybe if we just increase the time interval, is Folfox still needed? Or what about a shorter course or less toxic therapy such as biologics or immunotherapy that Dr. George mentioned? Um, and then just identifying more agents that may increase the sensitivity to radiation may be the answer. The PROSPECT trial, which the, we know the results are still pending, but this should help us answer some of the questions of whether we need both radiation therapy and chemotherapy. One of the trials that just opened uh, over the last few years in Italy looks more closely at this and, and the question of whether adding more time alone will increase the path CR rate. This Italian trial randomized patients to eight weeks versus 12 weeks intervals between the completion of chemoradiation therapy and surgical resection. Again, more preoperative treatment or just more time. And hopefully when these results come out, it'll give us more answers. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Balsh. That's a great study. We're looking forward to the results of that one. Um, so the third point that we want to address is uh, the pros of TNT, uh, meaning uh, that early treatment of micrometastatic disease uh, occurs earlier in the course of the treatment. Uh, but in doing so, we, uh, we lose the ability to uh, adapt strategies after preoperative therapy uh, based on patients who continue to have uh, adverse pathologic findings. So again, going back to the historical, you know, paradigm for rectal cancer management, particularly uh, stage two and two, three, and, and three cancers. Um, after chemo radiation, we're we're left with a sterilization of tumor in only about one out of five patients, and then we uh, try to deliver postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, but in my opinion, it's this postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy, which is the 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 
you know, the, 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 it's the, the modality that currently is preventing us from curing more patients. Uh, I think we've been uh, fairly effective in controlling the disease in the pelvis uh, with a, a very small numbers of uh, local recurrences, uh, both through a total mesorectal excision approach with uh, uh, high quality surgical margins, as well as uh, uh, ionizing radiation. Um, but the delivery of systemic therapy to eradicate micrometastatic disease, which is ultimately what kills patients, is, is truly the, 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 the area that we need the most, uh, the most benefit from in the future. So with traditional chemo radiation in this paradigm as shown here, um, we're usually delaying systemic management of micrometastatic disease for at least four to six weeks postoperatively. Um, and uh, that can sometimes be actually months after an initial diagnosis is made. So this, of course, is whether or not uh, adjuvant therapy is able to be given at all. And we know that there's many challenges with giving postoperative chemotherapy. Uh, between 25 to 50 percent of patients in clinical trials intended to receive adjuvant therapy didn't, uh, although they were included in the intent to treat analysis, thus skewing some of the data that Dr. Balsh showed earlier, uh, demonstrating that there's been no survival advantage shown to adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, granted, this were, these were patients in clinical trials, uh, which represent uh, all the I's being dotted and T's being crossed and, and patients who had uh, access to, uh, to, to high quality care. Um, delays when uh, treatment is given, um, it's usually uh, given in the setting of postoperative healing. And for every four week delay that adjuvant chemotherapy is, uh, requires, we see less efficacy of that uh, as translated into a reduction in mortality. So the longer you wait to give postoperative therapy, the less, the less well it works. And when we do give it postoperatively, uh, we're almost, uh, we're very commonly, at least a third of the time, needing to give uh, a 5-FU dose that is 30% of uh, what it was intended. So we're having to shortchange what we are delivering when we deliver it. So this led to the uh, opportunity to move things into a total neoadjuvant uh, approach and just to uh, give it uh, up front as part of the TNT uh, paradigm. And so by doing so, in some early studies that have, uh, that have addressed uh, in, uh, compliance with chemotherapy in a total neoadjuvant approach, the GCR3 study, which was based uh, in Spain, was the, one of the first randomized phase two studies of the traditional approach of, of uh, giving chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, our, our historical uh, experience, as opposed to incorporating it into TNT, showed a pretty significant improvement in the compliance to delivering chemotherapy uh, from 60% to 90%. Uh, and in both of the experimental arms and associated control arms of uh, NRGGI002, where all therapy was given in a total neoadjuvant manner, we've consistently shown in the U.S. Uh, through both academic centers as well as uh, community practices that uh, compliance with chemotherapy in the total neoadjuvant approach is uh, in excess of 90%. So at the end of the day, um, you know, the pro tip here is that uh, we can't expect chemotherapy to work if the patient doesn't get it. So we shouldn't expect to see improvements in survival if we're not actually eradicating micrometastatic disease effectively. Thanks, Dr. George. It's hard to argue with the, the delay in chemotherapy, and I think we underestimate the impact that these operations have on people and the, the recovery that it takes. Uh, so if there is a pathologic complete response to chemo radiation therapy, then patients may, be, may not need further treatment. Uh, but one of the issues with rectal cancer that I mentioned is inaccurate staging and the difficulty in determining if a patient truly has had a complete response based on imaging and, and endoscopy, a clinical complete response. So this makes it very difficult to base further treatment just on uh, clinical imaging and endoscopy and exam. We really don't know if clinical complete response based on uh, is truly equal to a pathologic complete response. Furthermore, we don't know the optimal sequence of TNT is induction chemo versus radiation followed by consolidation chemo better. Uh, I know some of those things are being looked at, but as of today, we really just don't know uh, the best uh, sequence of therapies. Great points. 
All right. The fourth, uh, the fourth uh, topic that we want to address uh, in TNT is that uh, it offers an in vivo assessment of the tumor's uh, innate sensitivity and uh, inherent biologic uh, features, but it uh, does require accurate staging, which is uh, easier said than done. So when we're talking about assessing treatment response, you know, for patients with metastatic disease, this is actually pretty simple for colorectal cancer. We use cross, uh, cross-sectional uh, imaging. Uh, we measure uh, uh, long and short axes uh, with regards to doing resist measurements, and we can utilize the patient's CEA for those who have an elevated CEA as a marker of, uh, of gauging whether a treatment response is, uh, is occurring or not. Obviously, that's in the context of monitoring the patient, monitoring toxicity, uh, and then making go-no-go decisions on whether what we're doing is, is working, but at least we have some objective data to support making those decisions. In the adjuvant setting, it's different. In the adjuvant setting, it's really more of a leap of faith. Um, we're delivering systemic therapy in the adjuvant setting based upon probabilities that are derived from populations of patients that were treated in clinical trials. Now, now granted, we have the patient, the N of one sitting in front of us, and we're using uh, the patient's risk for recurrence to know whether or not those probabilities apply. But at the end of the day, we really aren't able to objectively know if what we're doing is working. Uh, we have to just let the test of time uh, tell us uh, if we've actually benefited that patient uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful in a meaningful way. So by giving chemotherapy in a total neoadjuvant approach, it really does give us, uh, affords us the opportunity to objectively follow the patient's treatment response. And, and I think this is really critical if we're going to ever standardize our modalities where we try to spare uh, spare the patient from one or more modality of therapy. So if we ever want to think about a non-operative approach or selectively eliminate radiation like is being uh, uh, tested in the PROSPECT trial that uh, Dr. Balsh alluded to earlier, uh, we really need this, assess this objective assessment. Similarly, if we're going to de-escalate therapy, uh, move to, for example, a short course radiation as opposed to long course radiation, or get to a point where we recognize that a patient's cancer is innately resistant to the treatment that we're offering and we want to cut bait and move entirely in a different direction for that patient, uh, we, we really need to have objective data to be able to support doing that. Now, now we need better biomarkers. I'll be the first to, to be the first to, to argue that uh, where we're currently at with our uh, uh, radiographic imaging is is far from ideal. Uh, bioimaging, radiomics, circulating tumor DNA, and genomic profiling of both the patient and the tumor are areas of uh, really untapped potential in this space. And we've been fortunate in uh, several of our total neoadjuvant clinical trials, including uh, uh, GI002 uh, from NRG, where we've been able to embed and bake in serial imaging and serial tissue and tumor analyses uh, from patients uh, who have uh, been partners in this process to really help us better understand and, and hopefully uh, develop uh, personalized treatment plans in the future based on the mechanisms of treatment resistance that emerge. So we can get the patient's baseline genomic DNA, we can get bioimaging and radiomic assessments in serial manner. We even with rectal cancer have the opportunity to do serial tumor sampling uh, under the right conditions. And obviously circulating tumor DNA and the so-called liquid biopsy, I think is really gonna be uh, an area of, uh, of really um, uh, ex uh, exponential growth uh, in, this, uh, in, in this space of, of research in the next few years. Thank you, Dr. Okay. George. Uh, The MRI for staging rectal cancer, as we've already talked about, is not only inaccurate for the initial staging of rectal cancer, it's even more inaccurate for the assessment of response. So basing treatments on our best modality today, which is a diffusion-weighted MRI, where it's likely going to lead to the over-treatment of some patients and even the under-treatment of others, given the inaccuracy. Uh, nodal staging is even less accurate than tumor staging. There is a, a large meta-analysis that I le have listed here showing that the MRI ac accuracy um, is around 75% for T-stage and 71% for the N-stage. So it's even worse after treatment due to edema and fibrosis. So uh, another study that looked at the sensitivity of diffusion-weighted MRI did show significant improvement from a standard MRI where it was about zero to 40% sensitive up to 50 to 64% uh, more 
sensitive with the diffusion weighted MRI. The problem with diffusion MRI, uh, weighted MRIs is um, the negative predictive value is higher, somewhere around 90% uh, in most studies, and the positive predictive value is only around 60%. So we're very good at telling who has not had a complete, complete clinical response, but we're not so good at telling who's actually had a complete clinical response. So if we cannot tell who's had a, a complete clinical response, we have to be very cautious when we offer alternative strategies such as non-operative approaches or um, or other therapies or other alternatives such as uh, eliminating radiation therapy. But hopefully, as Dr. George mentioned, some of the newer uh, technology and modalities that are in the works will help us become more accurate in our staging and, re and predicting responses. Great points. All right, and last but not least, uh, we're going to focus on uh, the benefits of totally adjuvant therapy and, and allowing patients to fully recover after surgery, um, as opposed to uh, there, there really being no level 1A evidence uh, supporting clinical benefit. So the unencumbered post-op recovery, you know, I mean, let's be honest, surgery followed by chemotherapy is rough on patients, um, particularly um, managing a new ostomy, even if temporary, while also dealing with chemotherapy. It, it, it's kind of cruel and unusual punishment for, for many patients. Uh, we don't even like to do it as providers, uh, let alone uh, see our patients have to suffer uh, through, uh, through both of those uh, recoveries and transitions. So, so why not let the patient fully heal and convalesce after completing their surgery and reverse the ostomy as soon as it's appropriate to do so, remove their port, really allow them to get back to kind of a, 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 an opportunity of, of normalcy uh, as they enter uh, active surveillance. So, you know, who wouldn't want this? Uh, yeah, I think the patients want it. Uh, surgeons would be happy to not have to take patients back um, uh, dealing with uh, potential complications during, uh, during chemotherapy. And medical oncologists uh, would like to see more patients get uh, the compliant therapy. So, uh, yeah. And, th and this is usually the number one argument you hear against the TNT protocols is there are no long-term outcomes uh, reported for TNT protocols and studies, which is gonna change in the near future, uh, especially with Dr. George's health. Uh, but the problem with rectal cancer studies in general is we're dealing with a lot of mixed populations. There's really been no delineation uh, prior to treatment of low, intermediate, intermediate and high risk patients. We've evolved from endorectal ultrasound and regular MRIs uh, to newer MRI techniques, such as the fusion weighted techniques. So, um, we have had mixed strategies um, and old versus the newer chemotherapy regions. We've mixed populations of patients that have different responses to therapies. But like Dr. George mentioned, I think it's really the future is looking at genetics, genomics, epigenetics, uh, molecular pro profiling, the liquid biopsies, bioimaging, and these sorts of things are really going to be the key to personalizing therapy and uh, enabling us to provide the best uh, therapy and the optimal sequence of therapy for these patients. As we mentioned at the very beginning, there's just a lot of work to be done in rectal cancer. So I think that ends our debate today. Um, I really appreciate uh, Dr. George and his time and really enjoyed uh, doing this presentation with him in this debate. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today and, and for your attention. Have thank you, Dr. Day. Walsh. Thank you. Take care. Hi, my name is Christina Wu. I'm one of the GI medical oncologists here at Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University. Um, and I'm here to talk about updates in the management of metastatic colorectal cancer in the era of comprehensive genomic analysis. Um, this is an outline of the molecular targets that we're incorporating into clinical practice these days. Wanted to emphasize and talk about the targets I have in bold because we know about KRAS, NRAS, wild type patient, uh, tumor pa uh, patients who have KRAS, NRAS, wild type tumors who are eligible for cetuximab and panitumumab. 
We also know that the very rare intract mutation um, also selects for patients who will be eligible for levotrectinib. But I'd like to spend some time talking about new data for the MSI high or deficient mismatch repair, high TMB, um, BRAF, B6, or E mutation, HER2 amplification, as well as KRAS mutation. To start off with, uh, for the MSI high patients, there is Keynote 177. Um, this is the trial for our patients who have either MSI high by PCR or deficient mismatch repair by immunohistochemistry metastatic colorectal cancer. And this trial is done for patients who are treatment naive. Patients were randomized one-to-one, -one, either to pembrolizumab or um, the investigated choice of a doublet chemotherapy with a biologic. Um, there are dual primary endpoints in this clinical trial, looking at progression-free survival and overall survival, as well as secondary endpoints with over looking at overall response rate by rhesus, as well as safety. Um, the patients who received chemotherapy had the option of crossover with disease progression. Um, this is just to show the statistical uh, considerations that I talked about, um, looking at the dual primary endpoints of progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, what has been reported out thus far has only been the progression-free survival as we are waiting um, for the overall sur survival um, data to mature. Now, this chart shows us um, progression-free survival, and in blue are the pembrolizumab-treated arm, and in the more reddish line, you can see that those are the chemotherapy-treated um, uh, arm. And as we can see, that there is improvement in progression-free survival for patients on pembrolizumab, median overall survival of approximately 16.5 months, double of what we see with the chemotherapy arm of 8.2 months. When they looked at um, the key subgroups, it did seem that all subgroups favored um, treatment with pembrolizumab. We do see one outlier, um, patients with KRAS and NRAS mutant, um, which is interesting. But as you can see, patients with um, right or left primary tumors and BRF wild type or mutant tumors did seem to favor the pembrolizumab arm. And this is of interest because we often do see BRAF mutate, uh, mutant tumors in our MSI high patient populations. Um, and this is just to show the best anti-tumor response that was seen. Um, on the left, we see with pembrolizumab, where we see more PRs and CRs. And on the right, with chemotherapy, where we had more stable disease. And also looking at duration of response, which is very meaningful for our patients, there did seem to be improvement in duration of response um, in the pembrolizumab arm, um, which has not been reached yet. Uh, but looking at medium um, disease uh, duration of response of 10.6 months for the chemotherapy arm. So there were patients who crossed over. About 36% of the patients in the chemotherapy arm crossed over to receive pembrolizumab. Um, and actually another 35 patients um, went on to receive immunotherapy off of trial after they came off study. And as like I said, the overall survival data is still pending. Progression-free survival two, or PFS2, is time from randomization to progression on the next line of therapy or any cause of death. And as you can see, again, in the pembrolizumab arm, um, patients are doing better, even with PFS2 analysis. And this is um, just out of curiosity, the sub summary of the subsequent treatments that patient had. And as you can see, patients who were on pembrolizumab um, went on to receive chemotherapy after disease progression and patients with chemotherapy on the chemotherapy treatment arm then went on to um, immunotherapy. Um, and this is also very meaningful for our patients um, looking at adverse events in our treated patients. Um, on the left in the blue, we can see that there is far less um, diarrhea, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, um, and other problems that we know with chemotherapy with the immunotherapy arm as compared to the red bars, which is the chemotherapy arm. And they also looked at um, quality, quality of life, functional status. On the left, we have um, looking at quality of life and going down was looking at change from baseline for the worse or decline where the bar is going down. And you can see that's predominantly in the chemotherapy arm. On the right, looking at symptoms and what we want and going with the bars going down, meaning improvement, we could see that pain, diarrhea, and other things improved with immunotherapy as well as compared to chemotherapy where the bars went up. 
So summary conclusions are that pembrolizumab did provide clinically meaningful and statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival when compared to chemotherapy in the first-line setting for our MSI-high colorectal cancer patients. Responses were more durable, durable and also we had improved um, safety profile as well and really should be considered as a new standard for first-line therapy for our MSI-high patients. Also moving on to Keynote 0158, um, where pembrolizumab was given to patients who had high tumor mutation burden. Um, and this was a study of 102 patients who had metastatic solid tumors that had progressed on prior chemo regimens with no satisfactory alternative treatments. They defined high tumor mutation burden as 10 or greater mutations per megabase, and this was off the foundation one test. And in that, in this case, there was an overall response rate of 29%, and actually impressively 25% were partial responses, and the duration of response was not met yet. And so that is now FDA approved for patients um, who have high TMB. I want to move on to the Beacon trial, which was presented um, in last year's AS annual ASCO um, meeting, and there were some updates at um, JASCO. So this was for patients who had BRAF D600E mutant metastatic colorectal cancer, and it's a randomized phase three study. The study design was looking at three different treatment arms. Patients were randomized one by one to one. There was the triplet targeted therapy arm of incarafenib, benimetinib, and cetuximab. There was the doublet targeted arm of incarafenib and cetuximab. And there was the control arm of either Fulfiri or Irita TCAN in combination with cetuximab. And the primary endpoint was comparing the targeted therapy arms to the control and looking at overall survival as well as overall response rates. Um, this shows overall um, survival for all three treatment arms. In the black is the control arm. And as you can see in blue and red are the triplet versus the doublet targeted therapy arm. And they seem fairly similar in their results and superior to the control arm. Also looking at subgroup analysis to see if we can figure out which patients may be benefiting from a triplet for, the, for a doublet. Not quite clear, um, but there is a, a pretty clear spread in looking at all the um, different subgroups. The response rates were actually similar for the triplet um, arm of 27%. Um, and 20% with the doublet arm, and both were better than the control arm, which is only showed overall um, objective response rate of 2%. And as well as looking at progression-free survival that's been updated since, um, we also see that um, the progression-free survival was better either with the triplet arm in the blue versus control in black, or in the doublet arm in red compared to the um, black line of control. And adverse events were much more in triplet than the triplet arm as compared to the doublet, looking at things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, and so we do see more toxicities with the triplet arm, but similar um, survival when looking at triplet and doublet. And so the conclusion really is that encarafenib plus cetuximab does improve overall survival, response rate, and progression-free survival in patients with BRAF V600E. Um, they do need further um, follow-up in terms of sur for survival data to mature, but we now know that incarafenib with cetuximab is FDA approved for our patients with BRAF mutation who've already had first-line chemotherapy. I want to um, mention the SWOG S1406 trial. This publication was just end of last year um, in JCO. So again, in the same patient population, this was a randomized phase two study of cetuximab, irina TCAM plus or minus vemurafenib, and had very similar inclusion criteria as well. If we look at the graph, graph A, um, it is for progression-free survival, and in the red is the triplet regimen versus the blue, which is the doublet regimen. So we do see an in improvement in progression-free survival with the addition of vemurafenib. B shows us overall survival and C shows us progression-free survival in the crossover arm. So this does seem to be an active um, treatment arm as well. Moving on to HER2 amplification, um, I wanted to review a couple of the trials that have looked at patients who have HER2 amplification and are KRAS wild type. So in the Heracles trial, there were patients who were KRAS wild type 
um, and had high um, HER2 based on immunohistochemistry. 27 met eligibility criteria. Patients were given trastuzumab and lapatinib, both HER2-directed therapy. And these, um, these, these are just to show, these graphs are just to show that there was decrease in size of the tumor when they were given HER2 targeted therapy, as well as improvement and um, uh, progression-free survival. And markedly with the red lines are patients who had higher HER2 expression. My pathway also looked at HER2 amplified solid tumors and they had a colorectal cancer cohort um, and we do know that these patients also benefited from HER2 target therapy, which was trastuzumab and pertuzumab. The Mountaineer trial is an ongoing phase two study, um, the combination of trastuzumab and tucatinib for HER2 amplified colorectal cancer who have not, patients who have not had prior exposure. This is ongoing and open here at Emory as well as other sites throughout the country. And Dr. Strickler had presented his um, data from the trial um, at 2019 ESMO, in which patients had 55% response rates, and these were for chemo refractory patients, and there was a clinical benefit rate of 64%. Um, and now there's a new um, compound, which is, which is TDXD. Um, it basically is a humanized anti HER2 um, IgG and monoclonal antibody um, through a Cleavable linker um, is associated with a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor pay payload. So uh, basically an antibody linked with chemotherapy. Um, this has been recently FDA approved in the gastroesophageal setting for HER2 amplify patients. Um, but um, there is also in, in the upcoming slide um, present uh, showing the destiny, destiny um, study in colorectal cancer patients. So the study design was looking at patients who had unresectable and metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, patients had HER2 amplified disease, RAS and BRAF wild type who had prior um, chemo had chemo refractory disease. Most importantly, this was for people who had prior anti-HER2 treatment was allowed. Um, and patients were then enrolled in different cohorts. The readout is for cohort A, in which patients had HER2 positive immunohistochemistry 3 plus disease. On the top left, this shows efficacy. Um, looking at response rates, there was overall response rates of 45%, um, impressively with a PR of 43%. On the bottom right, we see the best change in tumor size, and we can see that patients who had high um, HER2 expression had a decrease in tumor size. I don't know if you can make it out, but the little yellow arrows are actually for patients who have prior HER2 therapy. So we know that this um, treatment is active for patients in a, um, who've had prior HER2 therapy. Looking at progression-free survival, median overall so progression-free survival 6.9 months and overall survival has not actually been met yet on this, on this study. Of special interest, along with um, some adverse events associated with chemotherapy that we know of, um, there is interstitial lung disease that is also noticeable in this um, with this drug. Um, and median time to report to onset was about 80 days. Five out of five patients um, developed um, ILD and received stop drug and received corticosteroids. Two patients recovered and one did not recover. So this is definitely something to look out for with patients who are receiving this treatment to monitor for the symptoms and hold drug and start steroids if needed. And this is sort of hot off the presses, um, I think a space to watch. Um, AMG 510 and MTRX 849 are basically targeting, targeting KRAS G12C. So we've known that KRAS mutations have been this elusive um, mutation that we've not been able to target for the longest time. And now there is some preliminary data um, uh, that we see with both lung cancer and colorectal cancer patients who have this KRAS G12C. And if you look at this um, chart, although change in size for the colorectal cancer patients here in the blue and the orange bars are not as impressive as lung cancer, but we do see um, stable disease and this is meaningful. So I think this is space to watch for in the future. And finally, we wanted to plug our Colomate trial. Dr. Diab, uh, I think it's talked in more detail about this, but this is a trial we have here and also throughout the states. 
um, where metastatic colorectal cancer patients with prior treatment with chemotherapy um, on disease progression, are, we test them for their circulating tumor DNA. Um, at this point in time, we're using Garden 360. And if we identify a mutation that we are able to target, any of the, any of the mutations we have on the right side, um, we are then able to offer them a targeted trial. And so we are definitely looking at the aspects of additional mutations that we can incorporate into our daily practice. So in brief, um, it's just sort of an animation showing how um, we think about colorectal cancer and how we treat them. Um, so when we start thinking about a newly diagnosed patient, we look at right versus left to determine if they have RAS wild type tumors, whether we can offer them anti-EGFR therapy, left-sided RAS wild type for anti-EGFR therapy in the first line. Um, we, if we detect BRAF mutation, would want to offer triplet therapy with full Foxiri, as we know that these patients may have more aggressive tumor, and so we want to give triplet therapy if possible. And most importantly, we want to know their MSI high status so that we can think about offering them immunotherapy. In the second line setting, we would switch the chemotherapy backbone, um, and again, look for RAS wild type MSI high and BRAF mutation. If patients have BRAF mutation, we now know that the Beacon regimen is a good viable option with encarafenib and an anti-EGFR antibody. And we have some data, phase two data with the SWOC trial. As for HER2 amplification, given the trials we've reviewed, there's trastuzumab and pertuzumab um, or trastuzumab and lapatinib. TDXD um, has phase two data. And of course we have the Mountaineer trial um, at various sites that we can offer our patients as well for um, HER2 amplified colorectal cancer. For RAS wild type patients, we can also extend to irina TKN and EGFR therapy in the third line if they've not been exposed to it in prior other lines. Um, and then also regorafenib or TAS-102 for patients who are RAS mutant. Again, want to stress that we wanna know all the genomic markers so that we can make the best decision um, to help our patients with targeted therapy or immunotherapy. Um, and don't want to mess out someone having MSI high, BRAF mutants, um, and HER2 amplification. Um, and of course, NTRAC, as I said before, with levotrectinib, um, and on to other phase one trials where we may have actionable, actionable mutations that we're targeting now. Thank you. Hello. I'm Maria Diab. I'm one of the medical, uh, GI medical oncologists here at Twinship Cancer Institute. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event. And today I'm going to be discussing the role of circulating tumor DNA in the early and advanced settings of colorectal cancers. I'm going to start with some basic statistics, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. As we know, Colon cancer is the third most common cancer here in the States, with a little over 104,000 new cases of colon cancer and a little over uh, 45,000 new cases of rectal cancer estimated for the year 2021. Colorectal cancer is also the third uh, leading cause of cancer-related deaths. The overall survival has a lot to do with the stage of disease that the patient presents with with a relatively good uh, overall survival in patients who have localized disease and a relatively dismal prognosis for those who present with metastatic disease. While we've made um, a lot of advancements in the management of those cancers over the past few years, a number of challenges remain, including um, those, uh, including some challenges in both um, the early as well as the advanced disease settings. For instance, um, we know that um, 15 to 5 to 15% of patients with stages 1 to 2 colon cancer will still relapse um, despite the best of our practices. Um, additionally, uh, we do know that for patients who have stage 3 disease who would have otherwise been managed with adjuvant chemotherapy follow, uh, following uh, surgery, we know that we are overtrading a significant percentage of those patients. Um, so we currently need better tools to assess for minimal residual disease um, in those patients uh, following surgical management. 
We also need better tools um, besides the routine CEA levels as well as our routine imaging to pick up early relapses, which would help us um, administer therapy in a more timely fashion. In the advanced disease setting, we currently also need tools to um, assess for diseases that are going to be refractory for our standard of care lines of treatment. We also need um, to assess for early disease progression, uh, hopefully even earlier than our routine imaging would have done. We also need some tools to, uh, to reflect uh, tumor heterogeneity. Towards that goal, a number of new um, um, platforms have been um, invented um, to try and um, achieve those goals that we've previously discussed. And one of them is circulating tumor DNA analyses. Some of the benefits of circulating t tumor DNA analyses are the fact that they are non-invasive tools um, compared to the, needing, the, the need to go undergo an, another biopsy, um, which is very inconvenient and is a very invasive measure. CTDNA analyses also have a very quick turnaround time for results. Um, we can have results available in a matter of days compared to weeks required for more comprehensive analyses. Um, CTDNAs also offer an option when tissue specimens uh, are not feasible for any reason. They also reflect tumor heterogeneity because they are not only reflecting the primary tumor, but also reflecting any metastatic sites that are present. Um, a number of platforms for circulating tumor DNAs currently exist, and we um, in our practice use platforms such as Natera and Garden360. And it's very important to differentiate between circulating tumor DNA and cell-free DNA. Um, as we know, all circulating t tumor DNAs are a form of cell-free DNAs, but the opposite does not hold true. I'm going to break my presentation into two main sections. The first one is going to go over the utility of circulating t t uh, tumor DNAs as a prognostic tool in, in, uh, colon can in colorectal cancer. The second one is going to go over the uh, utility of CTDNAs as a predictive tool. CTDNAs as a, um, a prognostic tool have been um, currently studied in a number of studies, um, all of which are redemonstrating similar findings. Um, for example, uh, CTDNAs were used in this trial um, in tumor in, in patients with stages one, two, or three uh, colon cancer. Um, the, the investigators analyzed tumor, tumor, circulating tumor DNA levels, um, analyses, I'm sorry, um, up to 14 days prior to surgery, and then their patients underwent surgery. And then CTDNAs were, were analyzed at the 30-day mark after surgery, as well as every three months moving forward until up to three years. The platform that was used in this study was uh, Natero. Um, as we can see in the left-hand figure, more patients um, arbored changes in their CTDNA compared to, to their CEA levels. Um, as we can see in the middle graph, CTDNA was able to pick up relapses sooner than routine imaging. And so it outperformed surveillance imaging following surgery. And as we can see in the right-hand graph, in the majority of cases, circulating tumor DNA was able to provide information about actionable uh, targets. There is clear delineation between the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, for patients who had negative ctDNA compared to those who had detectable ctDNA at the different time points on this study. And those results have been redemonstrated in a number of prior, prior and later studies, including two new presentations from the Terra um, in GI ASCO of 2021. 
Moving on as uh, moving on to the utility of circulating tumor DNA as a predictive tool in colorectal cancer. We've had a number of studies to uh, utilize those platforms. Um, number one, to assess response in the metastatic setting. And number two, um, to also assess survival. As we can see in this uh, study, um, in the metastatic phase, uh, stage of um, CRC, um, in patients who had received first-line chemotherapy, um, the investigators um, checked CT DNA as well as uh, CAT scan at baseline uh, prior to installing any form of therapy, and then moved on to test uh, the CT DNA um, three days after the initiation of first-line treatment, as well as before the second cycle of the first-line treatment. They also did imaging at the eight to 10-week mark after uh, starting first-line chemotherapy. The majority of patients were exposed to an oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy regimen. And this study um, utilized um, CTDNA testing through the SAFE SeqS platform. And as we can see here, there was a very good correlation between changes of CTDNA analysis as well as um, a response to treatment. Um, CTDNA analyses also outperformed CEA levels in the um, uh, surveillance uh, in, in the man in the um, following up of disease course while on treatment. Um, CTDNA also outperformed imaging, so they were able to pick up um, disease progression earlier than CT scan imaging was able to. And it was more so the um, degree of change in the value of CTDNA rather than the simple level of CTDNA that correlated more strongly with the progression-free survival. This is another study that shows that the utility of CTDNA um, in the metastatic setting of CRC is not only qualitative, but is also quantitative, as we will see in the following slide. Um, but this study showed that uh, the study enrolled patients who um, were going to be treated with chemotherapy plus the satinib and an anti-EGFR agent, and they um, followed patients prospectively and were able to see that um, patients uh, that, that the circulating tumor DNA analyses showed the evolution of additional um, genomic changes that were not available um, uh, before initiation of treatment. And as, I, as we mentioned earlier, it also showed quantification. Um, so it showed the degree of the increase um, of, of the changes that we were able to see in terms of um, the evolution of new um, genomic changes um, uh, in a quant quantitative fashion. A, um, a, a, an approach that's becoming more popular um, is the re-challenging with anti-EGFR treatment in patients who have metastatic colorectal cancers who previously uh, progressed on initial anti-EGFR therapy. And this trial, uh, which was a phase two trial, included uh, 28 patients who previously progressed on anti-EGFR and were later on treated with chemotherapy um, in combination with an anti-VEGF treatment. The idea behind re-challenging with an anti-EGFR um, um, medicine um, or a combination um, um, evolves from the model that when we install anti-EGFR treatment in the first-line setting, we are targeting the RAS wild-type population of the cancer, um, and we we cause we we cause um, a, um, a decrease in the um, um, in the growth and proliferation of that. Um, population, and we give the opportunity for the RAS mutated um, clone to proliferate, um, which then um, translates to resistance to anti-EGFR treatment. 
And when we do a holiday off of anti-EGFR treatment, the RAS wild type clone grows again, um, which reflects um, in an opportunity to re-challenge with anti-EGFR treatment. So going back to this trial that re-challenged patients who previously progressed on anti-EGFR treatment, we see that uh, on the waterf waterfall plot that we were able to observe six um, partial responses. Um, all of the confirmed partial responses actually did not arbor uh, a RAS uh, mutation when we did their circulating tumor DNA analyses. But we were also able to see a number of patients who um, achieved a stable disease on rechallenging with anti-EGFR treatment. What we do not know on this trial is what the, the, the genomic profile looked like at the time of progression on previous anti-EGFR therapy. But we currently uh, would rechallenge patients who were previously exposed and progressed on anti-EGFR treatment. Who, uh, whose, whose testing perhaps now does not show a RAS mutation. A number of ongoing clinical trials um, are currently open and recruiting, um, both in the early as well as the advanced setting of disease, um, utilizing ctDNA and a number of different platforms. In the early stage, we have uh, quite a few uh, clinical trials available here in the States, as well as internationally, um, uh, uh, with different phases of trials, as well as uh, different disease stages. In the metastatic setting, we have the acrylcolomate trial, which we actually have open here at Winship. This is an umbrella protocol that enrolls patients with metastatic colorectal cancer uh, who were previously treated with a fluoropyrimidine, oxaliplatin, irinotecan, as well as an anti-VEGF, um, or for patients who have a RAS wild type tumor, an anti-EGFR agent who progressed on those standard of care treatments. Um, this trial enrolls those patients and uh, tests for circulating tumor DNA, as well as um, a tissue screening uh, when available. Um, but if this is an umbrella protocol that tries to identify additional targetable uh, changes in the genomic um, uh, of the uh, tumors, and then tries to enroll them on uh, specific trials um, depending on what their testing shows. Good morning. Uh, I'm Mihir Shah. I'm a surgical oncologist at Emory. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. George, Dr. Balch, Dr. Wu, and Dr. Dia for an excellent presentation. Uh, just to go over the results of the poll that we had the two questions prior to uh, prior to the, the, the session. Is your standard practice is your standard practice to give neoadjuvant chemo radiation and chemotherapy prior to surgical resection for your stage two, three rectal cancer patients? And only two people uh, said no. So majority of the people, 90% of the people said yes. And then when we talk about do you think there is robust evidence-based data for TNT practice, total neoadjuvant therapy? Uh, one third of the people said no, two thirds said yes. Post debate and session results, is your standard practice to give new adjuvant chemo radiation therapy and chemotherapy prior to surgical resection for your stage two, three rectal cancer patients? It increased from two to seven. So I think there's still, still, uh, still there about 10% of the people saying no. And do you think there's robust evidence-based data for TNT practice? Uh, from one-third, it dropped to probably one-fifth, one uh, one-fourth. So I think, uh, I think the, the, the session definitely made an impact on the audience. So what I'll do now is 
I'll go over some Q and A's before I start asking uh, the questions to the, pa to the panelists. Uh, there's a question. I enjoyed the debate conceptually. We agree with TNT pre-op. However, how are patients selected for TNT? Are all rectal cancer patients offered TNT? How are patients having obstructive symptoms at presentation managed through chemotherapy? Uh, Dr. George, would you like to uh, speak on that? Sure. Thanks. Thank you. It's a it's a it's a very fair question. I, I think. Um, you know, in, in general, my approach to incorporating TNT uh, into into clinical practices, if I have a, a clinical indication for the patient to receive chemotherapy at all, based on their initial presentation stage, regardless of whether I think it ought to be given pre or post-operatively, if I think they're a candidate in need of chemotherapy, then my preference is to give it preoperatively, to incorporate it into total neoadjuvant therapy, uh, if for no other reason than just to ensure that they're able to more successfully get the, the systemic uh, components of that modality. Um, with regards to, you know, obstructive symptoms or near obstructive symptoms, um, you know, these, these are complicated cases. We usually take these on a, on a tumor board basis, on a case by case basis. I think it's, it's really critical to have the input from our endoscopists, our, our surgical colleagues, uh, and our, our medical and radiation oncologists. In some situations, um, chemotherapy can be used with near obstructive symptoms with a, a good results. Other times, maybe a stent needs to get placed if it's a, uh, in a location that, uh, that accommodates that, or just a diversion uh, in uh, diverting ostomy uh, in, uh, in general. So I'd like to get uh, Dr. Balch's input on, uh, on what, what he thinks is a, a critical kind of need for, for surgical um, bypassing up front. But I think in, in summary, these, these cases need to be presented as, uh, to the group and, and with a consensus of, of all, uh, all stakeholders involved. Great, any comments, Dr. Balch? Yeah, thanks, Dr. George. Uh, they, I, for obstructing rectal cancer, I think it's important to do the least invasive method that you can to relieve the obstruction, because most of these patients are going to need some type of therapy up front to make sure you get a margin negative resection. Um, I think it's most of them, if they're obstructed, they're usually going to be at least T3, if not T4 tumors, which is an indication for doing preoperative at least preoperative chemo radiation and many of these patients have stage three disease as well so we we try to stent um, and if we're not able to do a stent then i would we typically would do a, a diverting ileostomy or a, even a, a colostomy sigmoid loop colostomy to try to relieve the obstruction and get these patients on therapy first rather than trying to do a resection up front great thank you thank you uh, Dr. Diab, there's a question about what is the biggest obstacle to CTDNA as a reliable biomarker in routine clinical practice today? That's a really good question. I think the biggest hurdle right now is the fact that we still need some more data to guide as to how we use those platforms. Dr. Diab, results to come out. Um, the major hurdle is needing more data. Got it. And following the same vein, uh, what do you think about treating colon cancer patients with positive CTDNA without symptoms or radiographic evidence of disease to achieve remedy? Um, again, as I mentioned, you know, we will still continue to treat patients based on the current guidelines. Patients who have stage two disease who are candidates for chemotherapy should still continue to receive chemotherapy. Patients with stage three disease will still continue to receive chemotherapy. I think the major question in the, you know, in the current time is, is what to do with patients who have CTDNA positive who otherwise you wouldn't have treated, like patients with stage one or low risk stage two. 
those we still don't have data as to what to do um, if they do still have uh, detectable ctDNA levels, but we will know more from the ongoing trials. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wu, should we be doing more genomic testing routinely on all colorectal cancer patients? Yeah, I do. I definitely think we should. I think, um, you know, on new diagnosis of metastatic colorectal cancer, I do think we should be sending off for next gen sequencing. Um, often we can get the mismatch repair protein status back quickly um, from our pathologists. And that's definitely important because we don't want to miss an opportunity to offer immunotherapy if we can. But I definitely think that KRAS and RAP. BRAF status should be known upfront as well as HER2 amplification. You know, for a long time, it, we didn't know that it could help outcomes. It was more prognostic and it was telling us what we couldn't treat patients with. But now with new targeted therapy, I think it's all the more important that we have that data upfront as we start our first line chemotherapy. Great. And one more question for you. What are your views about BRCA directed therapy for mutated metastatic colorectal cancer? So we don't we don't know data yet about BRCA as we do as we're familiar with um, breast ovarian and pancreatic cancer, but there are a lot of clinical trials out there looking at patients who have um, APRD deficient um, tumors who can enroll on clinical trials that may include, um, for example, PARP inhibitors in, in combination with chemotherapy. So I do think that these patients um, should be enrolled on a clinical trial should BRCA be found. Yeah, I think clinical trials are very important for these patients. Completely agree. Uh, Dr. George, uh, there's a question from the audience about if you could review the differences in prognosis and treatment of left-sided versus right-sided colon cancer. Uh, left-sided versus right-sided. I think yeah. I, I think Dr. Wu did a did a did a great job of summarizing the the kind of the treatment algorithm for when you approach left versus versus right side. I think the genomic profiles of left versus right side really kind of help dictate whether you should or shouldn't consider using VEGF therapies as opposed to EGFR therapies up front. You know, I, I personally think that left versus right side is kind of the poor man's version of next gen sequencing. And I, I don't in today's modern era with with the availability of next gen sequencing being uh, almost universal. Universal. I think it's it's really kind of the onus is on us as as oncologists to make sure that we're getting sequencing done. I, I'm not sure I would in today's era really treat patients left versus right side without having profiling uh, performed. Um, I think it's it's different if you're in a situation where you can't get profiling done, then you can use left versus right as a surrogate for whether the patient's more likely to have. Um, a, a, an EGFR uh, a therapeutic option versus versus not, um, but otherwise I would just I would just sequence. Okay, great. Uh, you know we don't have any more questions, so I'm going to move towards the panelists, asking them some questions that I think will be very helpful for our audience. Uh, so for T2 N0 rectal cancer, mid to lower rectum, say about five centimeters from the anal verge, assume the patient is functional and the rest of the pathology is favorable. What is the standard of care or your practice for T2 N0 patients? Does everyone agree no new, no adjuvant therapy after a section for T2 N0? Dr. Diab, Dr. Wu? Do you agree no adjuvant therapy needed for T2 N0 pathologic staging? Yeah, I think it's reasonable to place those patients on surveillance. Okay. Now, let me ask you another question. What if it's E2N0 and only four lymph nodes are retrieved? Dr. Uh, I, I would argue the need for, for some chemotherapy after surgery. Would you do the same, Dr. Wu? So I've had a very tough case like this where we talked about pros and cons, the percentage chances of having M positive disease. Um, do we go back and, you know, Usually, it's, it doesn't make sense to go back and get more nodes. So I would have a conversation about adjuvant chemotherapy. It's a very tough case. What, what about you, Dr. George? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that the T2N0 status with inadequate nodal sampling postoperatively is without any preoperative therapy that may have impacted the nodal, nodal basin? Correct. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, it's a it's a challenging conversation with the with the patient. Uh, I would at least recommend a visit with medical oncology, laying out the the pros and cons of all the uncertainty. But I think I think you're left with you know approximately a 10 to 15 percent chance of there being uh, nodes in those you know in, in node numbers five through 12, which which should have been collected, um, and uh, that's the that's the uncertainty, um, and it's the node positivity that uh, really drives. Uh, metastatic risk. Dr. Balch, in the same in the same setting, you know, in addition to just talking to a pathologist as a surgeon and having a good pathologist, what can surgeons do to yield more nodes during low rectal cancer surgery? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. The, I mean, the number one thing is doing a total mesorectal excision. Um, so it's just making sure you're in the the right plane between the parietal and visceral fascia, it's, uh, sometimes that can be difficult to do, but usually it, it's it, the more you do this, the, the better you are at finding the right plane and, and making sure you do a total mesorectal excision because that should, just with that alone, that TME technique should give you an adequate lymph node count. Okay. And uh, so all these settings are upfront surgery and about adjuvant therapy, okay? And so now there's the same patient, T2, pathologic T2 staging with one lymph node. There are 12 to 15 lymph nodes retrieved, but there's one lymph node that has micrometastatic tumor, less than two millimeter of tumor, which by NCCN guidelines is not classified as a positive lymph node. Would you want to treat this patient with adjuvant chemotherapy or observe? What do you think, Dr. Diab? I would observe. Dr. Wu? I would have a conversation. You're saying it's a tumor deposit on a lymph node? There's a micrometastatic tumor in the lymph node, so it's still N0, but it's less than two millimeters. I probably would have a conversation about adjuvant therapy. I would be curious to see what Dr. George would recommend. What do you think, Dr. George? I, I would have a conversation as well. I'm not sure I would I would try to sell the chemotherapy, but I think at the very least, it's worth a conversation with the patient so they understand what the implications of the of the pathology finding are. And now that same patient also has a positive distal margin. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Paul, would would that would that be someone who you would push to medical oncology or radiation oncology? Yes, definitely. I definitely would recommend it. either there's a higher complication rate with radiation post resection, especially with anastomotic complications. But I would definitely push for chemotherapy at, at the very least. And Dr. Wu, you would do some form of chemotherapy at the least. Yeah, I would. I would have a question about chemo radiation. Whether you know it would make sense to do chemo first and then consider how the healing's going to consider chemo radiation with a positive margin, if it's possible. Any other thoughts, Dr. Deab and Dr. George? I agree with considering um, chemotherapy after surgery. I actually have a similar case in my clinic, um, somebody who received neoadjuvant treatment and still had um, positive margins. And for that patient, um, I gave him chemotherapy adjuvantly. Now, if the pathology comes back as T3 N0, Dr. George, in your practice currently, what kind of adjuvant therapy do you offer these patients? Upfront resection was T2 N0 clinically, underwent upfront resection, and now it's T3 N0. Yeah, this is actually a really common situation. Uh, I think it, it goes to what Dr. Balch had uh, argued that our, our staging is still is pretty pretty inadequate, um, and we constantly see these these wobbles between, you know, a T2 versus T3 or a T1 versus a T2. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think for, for patients that, uh, you know, stage two patients in this situation, assuming the nodal basin was was adequately assessed and margins are all negative, um, you know, systemic therapy or adjuvant therapy in the post-op setting uh, could be uh, could be a fluoroperimidine. Uh, the question is whether you really need the doublet uh, or if you need uh, if you if you can the, the, the main benefit just like in colon cancer for adjuvant therapy is the fluoroperimidine. The oxaliplatin 
addition is is of marginal improvement. It's statistically significant improvement, but the real bang for your buck is going to be the fluoropyrimidine. So in these situations where the the risk is uh, the risk of metastatic disease is relatively low, um, sometimes you can you can get by with just the fluoropyrimidine or doing the doublet with the oxaliplatin, but having a low threshold to drop the oxaliplatin uh, at the first signs of any uh, neuropathy. And now if the patient comes back, the pathologist calls you and tells you, Dr. Wu, that the patient is MSI high, T3 and zero, what would you offer as the adjuvant therapy? Um, we do not have data to do different from what Dr. George has just said in the adjuvant setting as of now. There is the atomic trial for adjuvant stage three therapy, which is combining chemo with immunotherapy and stage three colon cancer. So we're waiting for that data. But at, at this moment, we don't have data for that I know of adjuvant immunotherapy for MSI high um, in this setting. So would you do single, single agent or doublet at least because it's MSI high? I think we would have a conversation of a doublet because in the, in the stage two adjuvant studies, we saw that the MSI high patients did, did not benefit and actually did worse with single agent 5-FU. So I think we would have a conversation about a doublet therapy in this situation. Sounds like Dr. Diab and Dr. George are nodding their head and they agree. Yes. It just keeps getting worse, Dr. Shaw. These cases keep getting more complicated. You know, Dr. Dr. Paul said that this case was done in the community, but the same patient has a positive circumferential resection margin. Still MSI high, T3 and zero. Yeah, and that, that's what I was going to say. What really I think can help guide us in some of these situations is the radial margin, the circumferential margin. So in that the case before you made it even worse with the positive margin, I think if the, the radial margin is less than one millimeter, we know those are much higher risk for local recurrence compared to, um, you know, a greater than one millimeter margin. So uh, T3A versus a T3C, I think there's a difference in recurrence and that can help guide us in, in whether we should give adjuvant therapy or not. But so would you prefer radiation for a positive circumferential resection margin, MSI high, that is T3 and zero, or would you prefer chemo board discussion and potentially lean towards immunotherapy or still go with the standard of care of just post-operative? Well, as a, as a surgeon, I hate when my anastomosis gets radiated because <laughs> it usually ends up stricturing the, the uh, anastomosis and having to go back and do something else. So. I, I prefer as a surgeon to do chemotherapy if everybody on the tumor board feels comfortable with that. Yeah. Would you agree, Dr. George? I, I do. I do. And uh, just on that last variable with the MSI high status, I mean, MSI high in rectal cancer is exceedingly rare. It's an incredibly uncommon uh, finding. So it's like it's like a unicorn. So if you see MSI high in a rectal cancer patient, I think that's absolutely an indication for genetic counseling referral and uh, and uh, really thinking about um, about what what's the you know if there's a, a kindred or a family situation going on there. Very good point. Very good point. Uh, majority of eighty five percent of uh, colorectal cancers uh, that MSI high are right sided. So that's absolutely a very good point. Uh, you know, I have two minutes left, so I'm going to ask you these rapid fire questions, three questions, just so that the audience gets the maximum benefit from this. Is uh, what is your current practice for T3 N1 rectal cancer that is MSI high? What kind of preoperative therapy would you do, Dr. Wu? Um, I would I would still do um, you know, I would do TNT in this case. Um, I, I would offer neoadjuvant chemo and chemo radiation. Um, I, I actually had a patient who did undergo that and had a complete response um, when we, at the end of the treatment. I, I have found that um, the one or two MSI high patients have been extremely um, radio sensitive, actually. And so I do think I would still do the standard. I do think it's very tempting to think about immunotherapy um, in this situation, but there is still no phase three data for that. Um, you know, so I do think it's tempting, but I would probably still do the, I would do TNT in this situation. Uh, Dr. George, how can we get immunotherapy for these patients? Is there any specific scenario in T3N1 rectal cancer MSI high patients, the unicorn patient, 
that you think immunotherapy would be a good preoperative option? Yeah, I think the only situation where you could really justify um, uh, using immunotherapy in a preoperative setting for these patients is if they you knew they had a DPD deficiency and you couldn't get them a fluoropyrimidine safely, or if they had just really profound neuropathy from diabetes or some other neurocognitive dysfunction that made you really concerned that you just couldn't deliver total neoadjuvant therapy safely or successfully, and you needed a plan B option. But I think immunotherapy should be a plan B option, as Dr. Wu alluded to, at least until we have more data. Very good point. And if you start immunotherapy, last question, what is the duration of immunotherapy? Uh, you know, how many cycles or how many months do you do before? And when would you operate? How comfortable, how long would Dr. Bosch be comfortable in operating on that patient before I mean, getting chemotherapy? How long to wait before surgery? How long after finishing chemotherapy? Uh, how long uh, after finishing immunotherapy, say Dr. George plans uh, or Dr. DF plans for two months of immunotherapy before surgery for the same exact scenario that Dr. George described? How long would you like to wait before surgery after immunotherapy? Uh, usually, I mean, as far as the safety after completing the drugs, I, I think it's fine three or four weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the other question is looking at response and mm -hmm. uh, deciding on whether we want to do any other therapy or do we need to give it more, more treatment to get a better response before operating. Good point. And Dr. Wu, Dr. Diab, how long would be the total duration of perioperative immunotherapy in that scenario? One year, six months? I think we'd have to monitor response. There, you know, this is totally, you know, there's no standard, there's no trial to guide us in this situation. I would monitor the patient very closely um, because, you know, there are still patients with MSI high tumors that don't respond to immunotherapy. And you don't want to miss a window of a curative, curative situation. So I think, I don't think there's going to be a good answer. I think you'd have to monitor them very closely with serial imaging and then have a discussion in a, you know, multi-D fashion. I agree. All good, all good points. Uh, you know, I don't want to take more time. Uh, I'm already past time, so I'll let everyone uh, go. Thank you so much for such an exciting discussion. Appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Mehmet Akche. I'm a GI medical oncologist at Linship. I will be talking about sequencing therapy in hepatocellular carcinoma, which is indeed a good problem to have. These are my disclosures, and I will start with a case presentation. This is a 55-year-old man with cirrhosis due to NASH who presented with bilobar multifocal HCC and right portal vein invasion. CT chest revealed metastatic lesions in the lungs. The patient had ECOG 0, child PA5, and a recent EGD revealed no esophageal variceal bleeding. The patient was started on atezolizumab, and progression of disease was noted in the very next scans. What would you recommend for second-line treatment? Sorofenib, regorofenib, nivolumab, ipilimumab combination, cabozantinib, or lamotinib. We will come back to this case at the end of presentation. Some background about HCC, which is the third leading cause of cancer-related death globally. Usually occurs in the setting of cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis B or C infections, alcohol consumption, non-alcoholic state hepatitis or diabetes. Potentially curative therapies include surgical resection, liver transplantation, or local ablation. However, the vast majority of cases present with advanced disease, which underscores the need for highly effective systemic therapies. In recent years, several new systemic therapies were approved in the first and second line, and all second line agents were studied, studied post surafin Chronic inflammation and hypervascularity are hallmarks of HCC, and these are associated with CD8 T cell exhaustion, which is partly, at least partly driven by VEGF pathway. And a lot of the current treatments focus on multi-kinase inhibitors with anti-angiogenic properties and 
checkpoint inhibitors alone or in combination with these multi-kinase inhibitors. <clears throat> About one third of the cases in HCC are defined as immune class, and another one third are usually immune excluded. The immune class, and this is uh, still an ongoing research effort uh, to describe the uh, immunological classification of HCC, but the immune class usually is associated with higher immune cell infiltration and a genetic signature uh, which is more responsive to immunotherapy in general. And immune excluded class is usually associated with uh, chromosomal alterations which turns out to be more resistant to immunotherapy and one of those mutations is, is CTNNB1 which is the mutation of beta catenin VNT pathway. Multi-kinase inhibitors with anti-angiogenic properties and immune checkpoint inhibitors targeting PD-1, PD-L1 or CTLA-4 are the main course of treatment for current HCC treatment approaches. We do have three first line and six second line treatment regimens for HCC. Sorafenib was the only treatment option uh, for almost a decade after sharp trial, but then lamotinib was studied compared to sorafenib in reflect trial and was found to be non-inferior and subsequently was approved. It also actually had higher overall response rate and disease control rate compared to sorafenib but the study was powered for non-inferiority and it was non-inferior. More recently, atezolizumab and bevacizumab combination was studied compared to sorafenib in two to one randomization and uh, was uh, shown to have superior overall survival up to 19 months according to the latest updated data and higher response rate and disease control rate. And it, it was approved as the first line therapy for uh, HCC. In terms of the second line treatment options, regorofenib was studied compared to placebo in patients who progressed on sorofenib and was deemed to be superior and was approved for second line treatment after sorofenib. I should mention that these patients had to tolerate sorofenib for at least four weeks and they were all sorofenib progressors. Celestial trial looked into cabozantinib versus placebo in patients up to two prior lines of therapy, including sorafenib, and was noted to be superior to placebo. Ramesurumab in the REACH-2 trial was studied compared to placebo in the second line post sorafenib in patients with AFP more than 400 and was shown to be superior and improved. PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, were studied um, in the second line setting and reported about 15 to 20 percent response rate and both approved in the second line setting. <clears throat> Nivolumab was studied with uh, compared to sorafenib in the first line setting uh, recently reported that it was a negative study but still uh, similar objective response rates were seen with nivolumab and pembrolizumab was studied compared to placebo in the second line and that was also a negative study as it did not meet the primary endpoint, but similar overall response rates were shown in that particular study. Nivolumab and anti-CTLA-4 antibody ipilimumab was studied in the second line setting after sorafenib and a 31% overall response rate was reported and it has been approved as a second line treatment option as well. There are some emerging options. Uh, some of the studies reported encouraging overall response rates ranging between 20 to 36% with different combinations of PD-1 agents and uh, CTLA-4 agents. <clears throat> now that we have several different treatment options, the biggest challenge is how to sequence those system therapies and, um, and more and more data is emerging and the landscape is rapidly changing. This network meta-analysis looked into um, eight first-line randomized clinical trials and six second-line randomized clinical trials. And atezobev emerged as the most effective therapy in this network meta-analysis 
it was superior to nivolumab, lamotinib, or serapinib in terms of overall survival. In the second line, all the agents uh, included regorafenib, cabozantinib, pembrolizumab, and remisurumab were superior to um, placebo in terms of progression-free survival. However, in terms of overall response, overall survival, regorafenib and cabozantinib were the most effective therapies, and they improved overall survival. <clears throat> Remisurumab improved overall survival in patients with AFB more than 400. If sorafenib is utilized in the first line setting, all the agents I mentioned are actually studied in this patient population, and regorafenib was particularly studied in sorafenib progressors, which could be a very good option in that setting. There has to be a reason for atezobev regimen not to be utilized in the first line setting. So if it was not utilized in the first line setting, it could be utilized in the second line setting in the appropriate patient. In terms of lamotinib in, in the second line and beyond, we don't have clinical trial data if the patient received sorafenib in the first line, but there are uh, retrospective data suggesting that it could still achieve good disease control rate in the second line and beyond. If lamotinib is utilized in the first line setting, again, we do not have clinical trial data for the subsequent line of therapies. However, there are retrospective data emerging with the utilization of other uh, multi-kinase inhibitors after lamotinib. For example, <clears throat> this particular study looked into TKIs post lamotinib and had some uh, okay um, disease control rate, although not very, very good, still can provide some um, retrospective data to consider this agent if the other established therapies are not up to code. If first-line atezobev is utilized uh, in the absence of uh, clinical trial data in that setting, there are emerging retrospective data suggesting that multi-kinase inhibitors could be utilized in this setting. For example, this particular retrospective study looked into 49 patients and with sorafenib and lamotinib <clears throat> predominantly and reported reasonable disease control rate. But again, this is a retrospective study. In terms of lamotinib uh, after atazobev, this retrospective study looked into 36 patients after PD-1 or PDL one in the prior lines and uh, reported really impressive disease control rate with lamotinib, but this is also a retrospective study and this is only hypothesis generating. More and more data are emerging um, after failure of anti-PD-1 or PDL one when uh, anti-CTLA-4 and PD-1 are combined in that setting. For example, uh, epineal combination was studied in RCC and melanoma after PD-1 failure and reported reasonable response rates. And the same <clears throat> was studied in the HCC and reported reasonable response rates. There are some ongoing clinical trials which will impact the therapy sequence significantly. <clears throat> For example, the volumab and trevolumab are uh, being studied to com uh, in comparison to sorafenib, cabozantinib plus minus atezolizumab versus sorafenib, lamotinib plus pembrolizumab versus lamotinib plus placebo, which we also participated in this trial and it finished accrual. And there is also nivolumab, nivolumab versus sorafenib or lamotinib in the first line setting. HOSCO guidelines provide uh, significant uh, guidance in terms of sequencing therapies. First-line therapy is preferred therapies at Azobev per the HOSCO guidelines for the appropriate patient. If the patient is not a candidate for at Azobev, sorafenib or lamotinib could be utilized, and this is a strong recommendation based on high-level evidence. Second-line therapy after at Azobev, TKI might be offered according to HOSCO guidelines. <clears throat> and after sorafenib or lamotinib, another TKI, uh, immunotherapy or atezobev, aromisurumab could be considered. 
This is a weak recommendation based on not high level evidence. <clears throat> My approach is to utilize atazobeb in the first line setting for the appropriate patient, uh, which means the patient would have child abuse score A, class A, and no very severe bleed in the last six months, no uh, stroke or MI in the last three months, and treated varices if any available. So patients would need uh, baseline. Uh, EGD if not done recently. Otherwise, lenvatinib or serafinib could be uh, considered. We do have more data for uh, B7 patients with serafinib, and that could be a good option. If serafinib is not a good option, we do have uh, data from 49 patient study with single agent nivolumab in B7 and B8 patients, which could be a good option as well. As far as second-line therapy goes, all the agents listed here are studied after sorafenib, and post sorafenib D agents could be utilized as well as atazobeb could be considered if the patient seemed to be a good candidate. And I should mention that regorafenib was studied specifically for sorafenib progressors, and it, <clears throat> it seems to be a very good second-line agent. If lamvatinib is utilized, Again, we don't have clinical trial data, but um, based on guidelines and retrospective data, these agents could also be utilized in the second-line setting. If atezobev is utilized in the first-line setting, regorafenib or cabozantinib could be very good second-line treatment options. And as we saw in the network analysis, these are robust second-line agents. And if, if no other options are available, maybe Nexavar or, uh, I'm sorry, Sorafenib or Lemvatinib can be utilized. If the patient did not have rapid progression on atezobev regimen and had initial disease stability, I would also consider EP and nivolumab combination in these patients who did not have rapid progression. So going back to our case, uh, which was started on atezobev combination and rapid progression was noted in the very next scans, probably not a good idea to administer nivolumab and nivolumab in this patient. I would consider either regorafenib or cabozantinib in this patient. And if those agents not uh, are not amenable, then either sorafenib or lamvatinib could be a backup. In summary, there is no clinical trial data for any of the agents listed as post atezobev or lamvatinib, but the landscape is rapidly changing and the sequencing will be impacted by the upcoming clinical trial data. Anti-PD-1 and CTLA combination in IO refractory setting is not established yet. We definitely need we definitely need the clinical trial data for optimal sequencing and for patients for IO refractory disease. Thank you for your attention, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. Hello, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today on high-risk biliary cancer. Is there a role for new adjuvant therapy? These are my disclosures. So first I would start off by saying that all biliary cancers should be considered quote unquote high risk. These are rare cancers. So I highlights the need for multi-institutional and multinational collaboration. And the majority unfortunately are not resectable at presentation. Thus it's impossible to enroll patients in neoadjuvant trials if they do not have resectable disease. Now preoperative tissue diagnosis is something that is necessary for neoadjuvant trials. For hyalurcholangiocarcinoma, it's very difficult to obtain tissue diagnosis, and the new adjuvant therapies that are done for the transplant protocols are often done without a tissue diagnosis. For distal cholangiocarcinoma, it is almost impossible to reliably differentiate it between pancreas cancer and the preoperative setting. Thus, for the remainder of this talk, we will focus on incidental gallbladder cancer and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Now, the role of new adjuvant therapy is yet to be defined, and I will hopefully outline for you some of the work that we are doing in order to help define that role in the future. 
Just as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on incidental gallbladder cancer and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. First on incidental gallbladder cancer, we have to ask ourselves, is simple cholecystectomy oncologically appropriate? If the answer is yes, then no further therapy is needed. However, if the answer is no, then usually patients are recommended to move on to re-resection. And this is based on multiple retrospective series, this one from the French, showing that patients who undergo re-resection in green have improved survival compared to those patients who do not undergo re-resection shown in blue. This is also T-state specific, as you can see, that the absolute survivals are different between T2 and T3. Nevertheless, those who undergo re-resection do have improved survival. Based on these data, we put forth a consensus statement in 2015 from the AHPBA stating that patients with incidentally identified T1B, T2, or T3 disease in a cholecystectomy specimen should undergo re-resection unless contraindicated by advanced disease or poor performance status. A re-resection entails a partial hepatectomy of the surrounding liver around the gallbladder fossa, as well as a regional portal lymph node dissection. Now, the rationale for doing re-resection is to remove any residual disease that could be left behind with just a simple cholecystectomy. Now, it is important to note that the incidence of residual disease can be quite high. And when looking at the series, T1 disease comprises only approximately 10% or less of patients in the United States diagnosed with incidental gallbladder cancer. The majority are T2, T3 disease, and the incidence of residual disease ranges anywhere from 50 to almost 80%, with the majority being in the regional lymph nodes. It's important to note that residual disease is a very poor prognostic factor. As you can see from this study, again, from the French group, those patients who had residual tumor in their specimen had much decreased survival compared to those who did not. And residual disease actually may be more important than T stage alone, as you can see that patients with advanced T stage but no residual disease actually had improved survival compared to those patients who did have residual disease, even with a lesser T stage. And if you look at the study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, those patients who did have residual disease, nearly 40% of them recurred at one year. So nearly half of patients are recurring one year after re resection. So we have to do better. In order to do better, first we have looked at adjuvant therapy, and it's important to note that gemcitabine cisplatin is the standard of care for biliary tract malignancies based on the ABCO2 trial where gemcis afforded a median survival of 11.7 months compared to gemcitabine being 8.3 months. Now the PRODEED study looked at an adjuvant study administering patients to either receive gemox or gemcitabine oxaliplatinum compared to surveillance. Now, although this was a statistically a negative study, the median recurrence-free survival in the surveillance arm was 18.5 months versus 30.4 months in the gem ox arm. And if you look at this uh, underpowered, but nevertheless subset of uh, site-specific disease, you can see in gallbladder cancer, there seems to be a signal that gem ox has efficacy. So although this trial had a very ambitious hazard ratio and may have been underpowered, it's hard to completely ignore the clinical difference in recurrence-free survival between the adjuvant GEMOX group versus surveillance. Next came the BILCAP trial, which again, very similar design, phase three study, randomizing patients after resection to receive either six months of capecitabine versus surveillance. And they found that this was a statistically difference improvement in recurrence-free survival in those who received capecitabine, almost 25 months compared to 18 months. However, in the overall survival uh, endpoint for intent to treat population, there actually was a statistically non-significant p-value of 0 0.09. Now, again, similar to the uh, PRODEED study, there was a very nice clinical difference of 51 months compared to 36 months. And in the sensitivity analysis and per protocol analysis, the p-value did reach statistical significance. Now, when looking at the subgroup analysis for the BILCAP trial, interestingly, when looking at just gallbladder cancer, the efficacy of capecitabine is called into question. Again, it's important, these subset analyses are not powered. So when looking at different adjuvant chemotherapy trials, we've talked about protease and BILCAP. The BCAT trial looked at observation versus gemcitabine and found no benefit. The ASCOT trial looked at observation versus S1, which is recruiting, but S1, again, is entirely used in Japan. And we most uh, interestingly await the results of the Actica-01 study, which is comparing now capecitabine versus gemcis. 
So the current treatment paradigm right now is upfront re-resection followed by adjuvant capecitabine or gemcis, depending on dealer's choice. However, there are challenges to this paradigm. One, we know that at upfront re-resection, about 20% of patients are found to be unresectable, either radiographically or at the time of operation. We showed that 50 to 80% of patients have residual disease, particularly if they have T2 or T3 tumors, and 40% of those disease recur, uh, 40 40% of those patients recur, have recurrent disease within one year. The data on adjuvant therapy is not great. No study examined site-specific disease. These are all encompassing gallbladder cancer and cholangiocarcinoma in these trials. GEM-CIS may be a more convincing regimen for gallbladder cancer, or at least GEM-platinum. And chemo after surgery doesn't address several challenges with re-resection that we covered. So we wondered, is it time to rethink our approach and maybe think about neoadjuvant therapy? So the rationale for preoperative chemo in incidental gallbladder cancer is quite rational. It can reduce the incidence of residual disease. It may improve resectability. It can improve patient selection for re-resection. And ultimately, we hope to improve survival. So in order to do this, one of my research fellows applied for the AACR ASCO Methods in Clinical Cancer Research Workshop in 2016, and she was accepted for it. And out of that one week, uh, course came this single arm phase two trial, which is basically patients with incidental gallbladder cancer would receive three um, cycles of gemcitabine cisplatinum prior to re-resection and then get adjuvant gem cis. Now, in order to run therapeutic trials in HPV oncology, it's very difficult because these are rare diseases and patients with surgically resectable disease are even more rare. And it's difficult, if not impossible, to run meaningful single institution therapeutic trials. So in needing to define the role of neoadjuvant therapy for gallbladder cancer, we turn to the cooperative group structure. Now, this is the NCTN, which is surrounded by the different cooperative groups, including ECOG Akron, NRG, Alliance, SWOG, the pediatric group, as well as the Canadian network group, as well as the community and core. Now, we entered through ECOG as Emory's Surgical Oncology Division is very involved. And this is just to highlight the process. It's a very long drawn out process in the NCTN. However, you apply to the working groups first, then you have to go through the ECOG GI committee. Once you get approval there, we get executive council approval. After that, the study is presented to the, work, uh, the working group or the task force at the NCI level, which is a multidisciplinary group and a multi-cooperative group. So there are medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists, all representing SWOG, Alliance, ECOG, and such. Once there is support and endorsement from the task force, then the trial is moved on to the GI steering committee. And after representation at the GI steering committee, the trial is either approved, disapproved, or allowed one revision and resubmission. Of note, only about 30% are approved ultimately at the GI steering committee. Once approved at the GI steering committee, then it goes on to CTAP for final approval and funding from the NCI. So we went through that process and approximately four years later, I'm very happy to present this trial or opt in. This is ECOG Akron 2197, where we are assessing the perioperative chemotherapy approach for incidental gallbladder cancer. Just to show you, patients are diagnosed with incidental gallbladder cancer, then they are randomized uh, to either the treatment arm, which they get for uh, three uh, week cycles for three months of gemcitabine cisplatinum, followed by re-resection, and then another four months of gemcitabine cisplatinum after surgery, versus the control arm where they get re-resection up front, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, again using gem cis. This is a randomized phase two, three trial that has been activated by the NCTN, is now available to be opened at any of your institutions through the cooperative group mechanisms at your own institution. So we're very happy to see where that will land in the next few years. Now, turning to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, again, similar to gallbladder cancer, the results after resection are much to yet are far to be desired, with a five-year survival ranging around 30%. So we need to identify, similar to gallbladder cancer, high-risk features, and we need to explore what the role of neoadjuvant therapy is for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and how can we push the envelope in neoadjuvant therapy by including molecular profiling. So what are the high risk features for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? You can see that size uh, is a, a um, 
Poor prognostics factor, as patients who undergo resection for tumors greater than five centimeters have much reduced survival compared to those with smaller tumors. Patients who undergo resection of multiple tumors have much reduced survival compared to solitary tumors. And it's important to note that these pathologic factors do not work in isolation. As the tumor size increases, there is an increased incidence of multiple tumors, lymph node metastases, high grade, and vascular invasion. And in fact, if you create a risk score for recurrence, you can see that patients whose tumors have more of these uh, factors, such as size or lymph node involvement, so the gold and green lines, have reduced uh, recurrence free survival compared to those who have none of those risk factors in the red or only one shown in the blue. It's important to note that the most common site of recurrence is in the liver itself, as two thirds recur in the liver. Thus, when we look at patients like this with multiple tumors in both lobes or even a dominant tumor with what we call satellites or moons, although these are staged as multiple tumors or stage two or T2, biologically, they actually behave like stage four disease. Now, lymph node metastases is another very poor prognostic factor. And this study done by Tim Pollack gathered data over almost 40 years from 11 institutions. This was a multinational study. And after looking at 450 patients, they saw that only about half of the patients were undergoing a lymph node dissection. Of those patients who underwent lymph node dissection, about a third were positive. And the prognostic value of lymph node disease is highlighted very nicely here. As you can see in patients who have lymph node negative disease, you can see the poor prognostic value of vascular invasion. But once lymph nodes are positive, the value of vascular invasion goes away. This is seen again with single versus multiple lesions that once lymph nodes are positive, the, the multiple tumor factor actually is uh, negated by the poor prognostic value of having lymph node disease. So when approaching patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we have to move beyond thinking of resectability as just technical in terms of inflow, outflow, and remnant, but we have to approach it biologically, looking at the factors that I've highlighted for you today, size, number of tumors, vascular invasion, and lymph node status, and decide is this technically resectable, but is it also biologically or oncologically resectable? So we need to change our mentality from a can-do to a should-do, and if we should resect, should we give some other therapy prior to resection? Hence again, the application and try to determine the role of neoadjuvant therapy for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The general paradigm is that first trials are done in the metastatic setting. It can take three to four years to accrue patients to a trial, three to five years of follow-up, and then one year to publication. So there's often a decade lag of extrapolation of data to patients with resectable disease. We have seen this with pancreas cancer, and specifically fulferinox and gem napaclitaxel, but currently now trials are just being completed utilizing these agents, and now we are extrapolating the data that we have learned from the metastatic setting to patients with resectable disease disease. I firmly believe that we need to study these concurrently. There's no reason that patients who have resectable disease should have to wait that long to incorporate these novel therapies in their treatment plan. So again, for cholangiocarcinoma, gem cis is the established standard of care. However, Dr. Schroff, now at the University of Arizona, uh, when she previously was at MD Anderson, did this combined study with the Mayo Clinic in a first-line single-arm phase two setting where they looked at patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma or gallbladder cancer. And instead of using GEMSYS, they added a third drug, nabpaclitaxel, which she uh, named the GAP regimen. Now, compared to that median survival of 11.7 months we've seen with GEMSYS on the ABCO2 trial, these results were provocative as the median survival was 19 months in patients receiving this triplet drug regimen. And looking at this waterfall plot, you can see that the disease control rate was very good. This led to the rapid approval of SWOG1815, which is an NCTN cooperative group study that is currently enrolling patients across the country. It is one of the fastest rolling uh, trials in history in which patients are being randomized to GEMSYS nabpaclitaxel versus standard of care GEMSYS. And we eagerly await the results of this trial in a few years that were presented by Dr. Schroff. So taking that new regimen, GEMSYS, nabpaclitaxel, we hypothesized that this new adjuvant therapy regimen actually could be applied for patients with resectable disease, but oncologically high risk. We leaned on the strength of the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, which is a very, very um, incredible patient advocacy group, as well as the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network. And we designed a single arm phase two feasibility study to assess 
whether or not giving this triplet drug regimen was feasible to patients with resectable disease. And of course, we had secondary endpoints looking at resectability, recurrence rate survival, and overall survival. Now, in order to enroll high-risk patients, we used exactly those high-risk features that I outlined for you, such as large tumors, multiple tumors, vascular invasion, or lymph node metastases. Currently, we have this study enrolling uh, out of these four institutions. We are about to open it at Oregon Health Sciences University as well. But prelim analysis and interim analysis on the first uh, 15 patients enrolled in this trial do demonstrate feasibility for this approach for patients with resectable disease. Now, molecular profiling is another exciting avenue for solid order malignancies and liquid-based malignancies as well, but it's particularly interesting in cholangiocarcinoma as there are lots of targetable actionable mutations in these uh, disease types. And if we focus on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, I point you to the FGFR2 fusions, which are present in approximately 15 to 20% of patients. Now, this has been looked at in the uh, phase two setting in patients who had progression on standard chemotherapy. In patients who had the FGFR2 fusion, those who received the FGFR2 fusion inhibitor actually had an overall response rate of almost 20%, disease control rate of over 80%, and this occurs at a less toxic profile than cytotoxic chemotherapy. This has been replicated multiple times by multiple different companies and multiple different drugs, all doing FGFR2 inhibitors for FGFR2 fusions. And you can see that the waterfall plots look almost identical. So again, now we have an opportunity of using FGFR2 fusion inhibitors for those patients who have FGFR2 uh, fusions. Now, interestingly, that mutation is also prognostic for potentially better outcomes. And thus we see that that fusion is present in almost 25% of patients with resectable disease. So we went back to the ICRN surgery working group, uh, which I have the um, honor of co-chairing uh, through the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. And we asked ourselves, can we adapt and apply molecular testing and targeted therapy to patients in the neoadjuvant setting? We focused on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma for the reasons I have alluded to before. It's easy to get a core biopsy and patients can tolerate preoperative therapy. And we focused on the FGFR2 fusion because it's present in approximately 20 to 25% of these patients with resectable disease. And it was easier to focus on one drug company in order to get funding for the trial. We spoke with patient advocates at the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation about the waiting period that it takes to get the uh, next generation sequencing back. <clears throat> and we thus incorporated therapy while waiting. Now, again, similar to the previous trial, we needed to demonstrate feasibility of doing this, of doing molecular testing, and of giving these targeted therapy drugs in the pre-op space. But this afforded us the opportunity for many secondary outcomes, particularly correlative tissue studies, such as looking at circulating tumor DNA. So previously, I presented you the opt-in trial. Now I present you the optic trial. This is the optimal preoperative therapy for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with FGFR2 fusion. Patients with resectable disease would undergo biopsy and undergo molecular profiling. <coughs> While waiting for NGS results, they would undergo one cycle of that triplet drug regimen, which we have already proving, uh, proving uh, to be feasible. And if they have the FGFR2 fusion, they will go on to two more cycles of the inhibitor versus if they do not have it, they'll get two more cycles of cytotoxic chemotherapy. All along, we'll be have an exploratory endpoint <clears throat> of looking at circulating tumor DNA. <clears throat> we plan to uh, run this study at these eight institutions, all who are active members in the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation and the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. And hopefully I've uh, alluded to how we are trying to still define the role of neoadjuvant therapy for these high-risk biliary cancers. Thank you. Gives me great pleasure to be presenting uh, today <clears throat> about the role of next generation sequencing in biliary cancer management. I want to thank Dr. Wu and the organizers at the Winship Cancer Center uh, to be invited again for the GI Cancer Symposium in 2021. This time. Uh, this time, unfortunately, uh, uh, virtually, but hopefully in the future, uh, we'll be face-to-face -face and live again. As you know, the incidence of cholangiocarcinoma is on the rise in the United States. 
uh, and uh, as well in the world. And this is primarily driven by intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Uh, these are driving uh, the, the bulk of, uh, of uh, uh, the increases. And uh, the etiologies are likely uh, similar to the etiologies that are driving liver cancer, primary liver cancer, so hepatocellular carcinoma. Unfortunately, this disease tends to be chemo-resistant and uh, uh, chemotherapy tends to be marginally effective at best in unselectably tract cancer. We do have a standard with gemcitabine cisplatin, the first line that's based on superiority versus gemcitabine. Uh, and we do have uh, now a, a study with Folfox following gemcitabine cisplatin failure that also did show a, a slight survival benefit. But overall, as you can tell, uh, these, these are... Um, uh, marginally effective uh, rates of improvement with chemotherapy alone. So when we think about biliary tract cancer, uh, uh, biliary tract cancer encompasses intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and gallbladder cancers. They've all been clumped together, um, and uh, essentially uh, uh, most of the times get studied together. But what we've learned is that the molecular genetics of biliary tract cancer is different depending on what part of the biliary tract you're looking at. For example, for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, ICCs, what you see mostly are FGFR1 and 3 fusions, uh, some mutations, and IDH1 and 2 mutations up to 20% of the patients. See some BRAF mutations, primarily XUS, um, but some in the US. For extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, primarily HER2 amplifications and BRF mutations, and the same is true for gallbladder cancers, although you see a multitude of other aspects, and BRCA1, BRCA2 can be seen across all three. Uh, so the, the genetic uh, landscape uh, of biliary tract cancer is very different uh, depending on, on, on what site you're looking at. So taking this in a different way, why? So why is it important to profile those patients, to do molecular profiling? Um, and, and this is a quite promising way for us as we move forward uh, in treating patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic and gallbladder cancers. Different ways to do it, so FISH, um, easy, quick, IHC, primarily for HER2, next generation sequencing, which is pretty much our standard now, but also we include circulating tumor DNA um, as, as an alternative for some patients but tissue and next generation sequencing remains the primary uh, driver of how we uh, uh, select for for genetic uh, aberrations to go after. When we look at the different targets, uh, for example, take the third line, IDH, IDH1 and 2 mutations in about 20-25% of intrahepatic cholangio. Go down to uh, MET amplifications, we, saw, we see those as well and 2% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, HER2 amplifications primarily in the distal cholangiocarcinoma, uh, as well as the gallbladder cancer, and FGFR2 fusions primarily in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Now, we still rely quite a bit on tissue for next-generation sequencing and biomarkers, but there's a cost that comes with this that includes a financial cost. Uh, liver biopsies and lung biopsies are, are not necessarily cheap, and um, there are risks. Well, in our institutions like ours and, and, and Emory's, large institutions, it's very rare to see these complications. But when we look across the board, there are certainly uh, significant complications um, with, uh, with uh, a rate of 5% overall. But the other thing is, uh, you know, oftentimes we see this in our clinics. The patient comes to the clinic um, you have to order the tissue. The tissue will take time to get to you. And by the time it gets to you, then you send it to your favorite company, NGS company that you work with, and it takes another two to three weeks. And here goes about a couple of months, and you haven't had uh, that answer yet. And that's problematic, of course, but that's what we have to deal with on a daily basis. The other issue with the tissue is heterogeneity. And both intratumoral as well as, well as intertumoral heterogeneity. Uh, so if you, like, uh, you look at this as an example from a, a renal tumor, uh, if you essentially look at <clears throat> the tumor mass, uh, you can see multiple subclones from the yellow to the pink to the gray. 
Um, so they can be different depending on wh where your needle hits. And that's also true for inter intertumoral, so when you look at different lesions across the body. As the science of cell-free DNA continues to emerge, and cell-free DNA is essentially shed, specifically circulating tumor DNA, shed by malignant tumors into the, the bloodstream. The cell-free DNA overall includes not just circulating tumor DNA, but the overall uh, DNA, and has revolutionized, frankly, how we look at, uh, at DNA biomarkers from, from cancer different applications, but for, for our purposes, primarily looking at um, uh, in the metastatic setting and identifying targets to go after. So this takes us to the liquid, what we call now liquid biopsy, to detect circulating tumor DNA. And we call it liquid biopsy. Of course, it's measuring circulating free DNA because it doesn't require except a venipuncture rather than putting a needle through uh, the liver, the lungs, or, or what else. The cool thing about this is that essentially it, it takes a sum of all the tumor. Remember when we talked about intra and intertumoral heterogeneity, uh, one thing about the, the getting DNA from the blood is essentially it, it is a snapshot in time, but also in terms of space, it has the whole spatial representation of the cancer. So all the tumors shed at the same time uh, or around the same time, and you're able, able to have a much better snapshot of how the genome of the cancer looks like. And that's important, and that certainly is helpful. But there are limitations, and some of these limitations pertain to the fact that in low shedding tumors, such as pancreas and, and the extrahepatic cholangios, not as much the intra, um, you may see very low rates of DNA in the blood even may have difficulty in detecting them. Um, there's also certainly a loss of capacity to capture efficiently the fusions, and we know the FGFR2 fusions are very important uh, for targeting in, uh, in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Um, and so these, are, these remain limitations, and they will improve hopefully with time. We do know that if you find something in the blood, it will be uh, also in the tissue, and that's important. So the specificity is very high. The sensitivity is, is the one lacking a little bit behind. But why, why do we like these circulating free DNA or circulating tumor DNA? There's these clonal dynamics that certainly, uh, you know, get affected by what you're targeting at a given point of time, depending on pressure from treatment um, or the, just the natural progression of cancer. And this, this comes from my friend, Scott Coppets from MD Anderson. This was actually in colorectal cancer where patients have had serial monitoring. And what they've seen is that 87% of those patients had either a gain or a loss of clones over time, which changes essentially the dynamics of the cancer and changes, changes our, our treatment paradigms. So one of the things also about these circulating tumor DNA analyses is that essentially as you go with time, let's say, you know, you start with this patient at presentation, you identify a target, you go with a targeted agent, and you bring this uh, target down to its knees, and then ultimately with time, it will start progressing, primarily driven by subclonal mutations um, that essentially, let's say, a truncal mutation or subclonal uh, mutation that drives tre treatment resistance. So you uh, essentially target that specific new mutation, you know, you bring it down, and then you rechallenge with the same agent, and then that's how you achieve the best response you keep on the two. Uh, and there are different uh, different ways to think about this, uh, and we have a lot of this now uh, being applied to our clinics across all GI malignancies, is how do we detect these emerging clones and how do you target them? Uh, uh, you know, can you can you detect those emerging clones even sooner than you see the scans showing progression and act on them? So a lot of applicability uh, for for circulating tumor DNA. So I want to start uh, with these targets that we uh, have uh, now available to target in 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 biliary tract cancer, um, and this certainly makes the case for. Uh, why it's important to get next-generation sequencing in all patients with biliary tract cancer, and hopefully earlier now in the game than uh, waiting to later. 
So FGFR2 is one of those uh, that essentially can get dysregulated, primarily intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in the form of fusions, uh, fusion genes, and um, they're present in about 10 to 15 percent of all cancers uh, with biliary tract, uh, with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and a number of agents are being developed. I mean, more than actually uh, 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 would be desirable in this uncommon uh, cancer, but certainly attractive because this is an active uh, a target that has active agents uh, uh, available. Now, in clinic, pemigatinib has been approved by the FDA pending, a, again, you know, a large phase three trial, but this is an accelerated approval. Infigratinib is being assessed by the FDA, and there is others like futibatinib, and the razantinib, and others as well. When we look at the uh, efficacy of <clears throat> the various agents, um, FGFR inhibitors and FGFR2 fusion cholangiocarcinoma, as I said, is about 10% of all patients with cholangio, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. You can see that the response rates um, fluctuate between the 20s to the 30%. So, for example, with pemigatinib, 35%, uh, with infigratinib, 25%, etc. The median progression free survival is pretty similar across the board, and the survival uh, relatively similar. Um, with pemigatinib has been reported to be close to 21 month infigratinib, 12 month, uh, but historically, um, you know, these 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 have gone at different uh, different speeds. The studies, um, and so it, it is possible that these differences relate more uh, to other aspects that are uncontrolled for. Uh, the median progression free survival is pretty much the same. Uh, across at least all three that continue to be developed uh, moving forward. So I want to go with pemigatinib, which is the one that's approved right now. So this agent was looked at in a large study, 100 of them actually plus, had FGFR2 fusions uh, with a response rate of 36%. Interestingly, with the presence of other FGF and FGFR alterations, there were no responses. Uh, the median duration of response, at least for cohort A, um, on the infigratinib study was 7.5 months. And this is now, as I said, approved by the FDA. And this is uh, how the waterfall plot looks like. Pretty impressive. Um, uh, again, you know, you see quite a few uh, uh, stable, uh, uh, I'm sorry, partial responses, three complete responders um, in, in the 107 patients, and then, and then a number of stable disease, uh, very few progressors. Uh, so that certainly uh, speaks highly of the biology uh, of 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 this target and and uh, the effects of targeting it. Uh, the toxicities are primarily uh, uh, expected for this class of agents. Hyperphosphatemia is certainly one that's managed with a low phosphate diet, binders and diuretics, uh, mostly low grade and and controllable. Hypophosphatemia is the other one uh, that's also uh, relatively uh, well controlled. Uh, there are some ocular uh, and, and uh, toxicities that uh, do need to be uh, uh, kept in mind, as well as skin toxicities and nail toxicities that can be quite severe. Uh, luckily, all are or most are quite reversible with no clinical sequelae overall. Um, and we're learning more and more of this new class of agents and the toxicities and how to manage them. The other agent in development is infigratinib. Uh, BGJ398 and uh, uh, an updated uh, uh, <clears throat> an up updated results of the study were presented at ASCO GI this year. Uh, again, showing very similar trends, uh, great response uh, rate, uh, uh, including uh, a CR, uh, many PRs, um, and very few progressors. And the median progression-free survival was reported to be 7.3 months on the study, which is very similar uh, to, uh, to prior. And then um, the toxicities, again, expected for this, uh, uh, for this class of agents, hyperphosphatemia, skin uh, toxicities, and ocular toxicities. As we are learning more and more about these agents, we're also starting to learn more and more about what may drive their resistance. And this goes back to the, to, the, to the initial question we were bringing about, we do our next generation sequencing initially, but then these patients progress and does anything change? What happens to the target? 
Well, uh, this very elegant study, uh, and now it's published in Cancer Discovery um, by uh, Dr. Goyal and colleagues from MGH, shows essentially that as patients progress, patients with FGFR2 fusions progress on infigratin of the BGJ compound, they actually develop certain mutations that are thought to be driving mutations, specifically this one, FGFR2V564F. And it turns out that you know these these mutations can be uh, can be uh, uh, targeted uh, with uh, <clears throat> with other agents such as TAS120 for futibatinib, uh, and some of these patients actually can see responses after they progress on infigratinib. These agents are moving into the first line with pemigatinib uh, as well as infigratinib and futibatinib, uh, all three moving into first line with different studies versus gemcitabine cisplatin uh, uh, in patients with advanced uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and FGFR2 fusion. Uh, this study is ongoing. Uh, uh, there are certainly some challenges with these studies uh, because essentially the, uh, the first-line studies require that the patients be tested before uh, being randomized. Uh, once they find uh, the alteration, and so that certainly is is challenging, given what we've discussed. Uh, the liquid biopsies, of course, you know, do offer a good a good alternative, but as I said, they can miss quite a few of these fusions. The other target of interest is IDH12 mutations. These are primarily target metabolism. And a study with ivocidinib versus placebo has been conducted, showing a primary endpoint of progression-free survival superior outcome for ivocidinib versus placebo. The survival was not much different, but when they adjusted for uh, the crossover design, uh, the overall survival looked more favorable, but of course, you know, this is limited as it's a secondary analysis. Similar to FGFR2 fusions, we do see that uh, in, these, uh, in these patients, uh, there are uh, uh, mutations that, that may arise uh, so IDH2 mutations when patients get exposed to IDH1. Uh, BRF V600D mutations is another one that's uh, uh, also uh, uh, present in about 3 to 5% of patients, mostly uh, uh, extrahepatic and gallbladder, but you find it also in intrahepatic. And the rural basket trial uh, looked at a combination of the BRAF and Ventramitina in BRF V600D mutations, which uh, again did show a, a whopping response of 41%. And, and great survival in PFS, and that continues to move forward. I want to finish it off a little bit with immune therapy. Uh, there hasn't been much activity with immune therapy. With MSI high, of course, uh, uh, the expectation is you do see high response rates. In this case, you do 41%. Um, but when it comes just to the PDL1 positive uh, uh, biliary tract cancer, the response rate is lesser, and these responses tend to be less durable and less impressive with a medium PFS of 2.2 months. Um, tumor mutation burden is a good measure also of patients who may respond uh, well to uh, PD1 inhibitors. A Keynote 158 study led to the approval of pembrolizumab in uh, uh, TMB high uh, patients. A TMBI has been determined to be anything above 10. Um, there were very few patients with biliary cancer included um, in, in, in this study. Uh, the, our colleagues in, in the UK and France are conducting this uh, large umbrella trial looking at multiple alterations and matching patients with the alteration uh, uh, depending on whether it's an FGFR fusion, mutation, etc. And so this is ongoing, a huge endeavor uh, that uh, is uh, underway. So in terms of conclusions and takeaway, next generation sequencing and the emerging role of liquid platform is central to future applications of novel therapy in biliary tract cancer. Applying genomic technology and molecular classification critically and timely in cholangiocarcinoma is changing the therapeutic landscape. And we already have a proof of concept with FGFR2 fusions and emerging with IDH1 mutations, as well as others. Molecularly targeted agents such as those targeting FGFR and IDH1 are providing patients with new treatment options. And we're trying to understand the role of others such as BRF V600D, HER2 amplifications and gallbladder cancer studies and that mechanism and then drug resistant mechanisms and novel strategies to overcome those. Moving a lot of these things to the first line 
uh, of course, as we see their activities in later lines. And we still don't have a clear understanding other than an MSI high where immune therapy is going to end up in this disease. And of course, you know, trying to put a lot of combination strategies together uh, to improve the efficacy. So overall, great times in biliary tract cancer with significant improvements and significant developments moving the field forward. Thank you. Hello, I'm Basil Arrayes, and today I'll be talking to you about current treatment landscape in pancreatic cancer. In the first part of the talk, I will talk about frontline therapy in the metastatic disease. Two trials that have shaped uh, the field in the frontline setting are the Prodige 4 Accord 11 trial conducted in France and the MPAC trial, which was an international trial. First, we'll talk about the Prodige trial, which compared for Furinox to GEM cytabine single agent, and here you can see the improvement that was observed in overall survival and progression-free survival in favor of fulforinox over gemcitabine. Similarly, uh, we saw an improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival in favor of gem paclitaxel when compared with gemcitabine single agent in the uh, IMPACT trial. On this slide, you can see the two trials next to each other, and you can observe that the population that were enrolled on each of the trials was a little bit different. And this is what limits our ability to compare the results across the two trials. This year at ASCO 2020, we saw an upfront trial comparing for Firenox to gem paclitaxel this time in resectable disease. And in this trial, uh, patients with resectable disease were randomized to either for Firenox or gem nap paclitaxel, and then uh, after preoperative therapy, they underwent surgery, and then further postoperative therapy. As you can see from this uh, results of this trial, number one, the trial failed to meet its primary endpoint, but there was no difference between fulforinox and gem nap paclitaxel uh, in this setting. And here you can see some other parameters, again showing the relatively similar outcome of the two regimens in the frontline in, in the frontline resectable patients. So is there a way to predict which regimen to use in the frontline setting? There have been a number of papers published and some of them are uh, highlighted on this slide, which have looked at patients with DNA damage response mutations. Uh, and you can see that patients with these mutations uh, uh, are present in about 17 to 25% of uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Here in the paper published by Dr. Fishvein, uh, in the first survival plot, you see that if you do not use platinum-based therapy, there is no difference if you have DDR deficient or DDR proficient. However, in the patients who receive platinum therapy, there's a clear benefit in the DDR deficient group versus the DDR proficient group, suggesting that the patients who benefit from platinum upfront are the patients who are DDR deficient. Next slide. Uh, similar data was recently published in clinical cancer research, uh, looking at a group of patients treated mainly at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, selecting the patients who are DDR deficient and the patients who are DDR deficient seem to benefit from platinum first line, while the patients who are not DDR deficient did the same whether they receive platinum or not, again, suggesting that DDR deficiency may be a marker for platinum sensitivity. Two genes that are commonly looked at in DDR deficiency are the BRCA and the PELB mutations. And as we well know, many of those mutations are germline mutations. Here you can see that in about four to 7% of patients with pancreas cancer, they harbor germline mutations in BRCA1 and or BRCA2. And these patients, as we know, are at a higher risk of developing pancreas cancer. In this trial from Dr. O'Reilly and her team at Memorial Sloan Kettering, patients who are known to have germline BRCA mutation or PELB mutation were randomized to receive cisplatin and gemcitabine 
uh, or cisplatin gemcitabine and a PARP inhibitor. And here you can see where the yellow arrow is highlighting uh, the population with respect to the BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB mutations. The results of this trial were very encouraging in terms of response rates, and we saw high response rates somewhere in between the high 60s and the low 70% for the patients receiving gemcitabine, cisplatin-based backbone chemotherapy. Unfortunately, there wasn't difference in terms of survival or progression-free survival, whether you add the PARP inhibitor or not. Based on the result of this trial, uh, the conclusion was that gemcitabine cisplatin should be considered a standard therapy in patients who have germline mutations in BRCA and PELB2. At the same time when this trial was being done, a parallel trial was being conducted, which is the POLO trial. And the POLO trial is a trial that looked at maintenance olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, in patients who have germline BRCA mutations and who have stable disease or partial response or complete response on uh, platinum-based upfront therapy. So patients receive platinum-based therapy, then they get randomized to either maintenance with olaparib or placebo. Next slide. And here you can see the progression-free survival, which uh, significantly favors the olaparib uh, over the placebo. Of course, this trial did not show an improvement in overall survival, but uh, it is still uh, the improvement, the improvement and the progression-free survival is still felt to be significant and impactful that uh, olaparib was approved in this study. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Here you can see the response rates, and clearly the response rates in the olaparib arm are twice the response rates observed in the placebo arm. But more impressively is when you look at the median duration of response in the olaparib arm was about 24 months. Uh, that is uh, much longer than the median survival that we observe in frontline setting for pancreas cancer. Again, suggesting that maintenance olaparib is a good strategy to consider in these patients. Next slide. At Emory, we are conducting a trial in uh, patients who have upfront diagnosis of stage four pancreas cancer. The trial is look at, looking at combining gem nap paclitaxel backbone with two agents targeting autophagy and the stroma. And we believe that uh, targeting autophagy and the stroma simultaneously will enhance the activity of chemotherapy in the upfront up setting. Next slide. In addition, we are conducting a trial selectively for patients who have upfront diagnosis of stage four pancreas cancer with weight loss and uh, poor performance status. And in these patients, we are looking at the addition of the litrostat to block serotonin synthesis and with the idea that blocking serotonin synthesis may enhance the ability to absorb food and allow the patients to gain weight during therapy. Now I will shift gears and discuss a little bit second line therapy in metastatic disease. For uh, second line therapy, there has been a randomized trial called the Napoli trial, which has compared nanoliposomal irinutecan plus 5-FU leucovorin to 5-FU leucovorin alone or naliri alone. In this uh, trial, you can see that the progression-free survival and the overall survival were both in favor of the Naliri plus 5-FU as compared to 5-FU alone. And here you can see the overall survival showing again uh, improvement in favor of the Naliri plus 5-FU in comparison to the 5-FU alone. Of note, the uh, Naliri alone did not have uh, any improved activity over 5-FU single agent. At Emory, we are trying to build on the uh, experience with the Naliri in the second line uh, by combining it with the TAS-102. Uh, and this style has completed the phase one portion and we are now in the expansion portion where we are looking at this combination in patients with uh, pancreas cancer in the second line and colorectal cancer in the second line. Immune therapy. There have been a number of trials, including uh, this trial from Dr. O'Reilly, which have looked at immune therapy in pancreas cancer. Unfortunately, the combination of PD-1 inhibitor and CTLA-4 inhibitors or PD-1 inhibitor alone have not had encouraging activities uh, in patients with uh, pancreas cancer. 
However, in a selected subgroup of patients who have MSI high disease, which accounts for about 1% of pancreas cancer patients, clearly benefit from checkpoint inhibitors. And this highlights the importance of us doing genomic profiling to identify that subgroup of patients that may benefit from targeted approach. At Emory, we are looking at combination of an anti-IL-6 and anti-PD-1 in patients with metastatic pancreas cancer who have failed at least one prior line of therapy with the idea that the anti-IL-6 may set up the pancreatic microenvironment to be more receptive to immune intervention. In addition, we are looking at a novel agent uh, which targets uh, semaphorin-4 in combination with immune therapy in patients who have uh, resectable pancreas cancer and patients who have liver mats from colorectal cancer. This is a window of opportunity study. Patients receive standard preoperative therapy, uh, then the immune therapy, then they go to surgery, allowing us to look at the effect of these agents on the tumor microenvironment and on the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Targeted therapies. There are a number of targets that uh, potentially could be uh, used for therapy in pancreas cancer. We already spoke a little bit about the DNA deficient repair targets and platinum based therapy and PARP inhibitors. In this section, I will focus on other targets that are at play in pancreas cancer. This paper from Dr. Fishvein, uh, published in Lancet last year, uh, looked at uh, about 1,000 patients with pancreas cancer who were genomically sequenced. And they divided the patients into three groups, uh, patients who did not have uh, targets for therapy, uh, patients who had targets for therapy but were not uh, treated with targeted therapies, and the patients who had targets for therapy and received molecularly selected therapies. And as you can see, the patients who received match therapy here in the orange line uh, did significantly better than the other two groups, suggesting a benefit uh, for molecular profiling of patients and selecting therapy based on that profile. Of note, about 15 to 20 percent of patients were able to be matched to therapies. Next slide. And on this slide, you can see some of the agents that were identified based on uh, molecular profile and used in the treatment of these patients. Again, this study is, I think, a pivotal study because it uh, highlights uh, the potential for us uh, to do molecular profiling and targeted therapy in a subset of patients. Next slide. Uh, of course, uh, one target that has uh, been uh, talked about a lot recently is the NTRAC. Uh, and NTRAC fusions are present in about 0.3% of pancreas cancer patients. And here you can see a patient with an NTRAC fusion who received NTRAC inhibitor and the remarkable response that they have. At Emory, we are looking at another target that looks very promising, which is uh, uh, a dual antibody targeting HER2 and HER3. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, patients who have uh, fusion genes. Uh, benefit uh, from uh, uh, targeting this approach. Uh, as an example, this patient who had failed multiple lines of therapy having a remarkable response to uh, the dual inhibitor. And again, this trial is open at Emory. So in conclusion, uh, the frontline setting, there are two main options, which are for Foranox or gem naptaclitaxel for patients with good performance status. Patients with deficient DNA repair pathway may benefit from platinum-based therapy in the frontline setting. Patients who have germline mutations with BRCA uh, benefit from olaparib maintenance after an induction therapy with platinum-based chemotherapy. And the second line uh, therapy choices are driven by what you use in the frontline. And if you use gemcitabine-based therapy, uh, then the treatment of choice in the second line would be 5-FU and 9-liposomal NETK. Immune therapy at this point is limited to patients who have MSI high tumors and high tumor mutation burden. Uh, otherwise, uh, immune therapy would be based in a clinical trial setting. Genomic profiling may guide therapy in about 15 to 20 percent of patients. Uh, and clearly, those patients may have very remarkable responses if you find uh, appropriate uh, tar therapeutic targets. Thank you. Hello, and uh, welcome to the discussion session. Uh, I hope this is going to be a very lively discussion session. We'll start with the uh, questions and answers. Uh, 
First case is a 76-year-old male patient who has a newly diagnosed stage 4 pancreas cancer, uh, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, and performance status of 2. Uh, and the, the uh, answers uh, there seem to be preponderance of GEM, uh, NAP, paclitaxel, uh, followed by Folquorinox, and uh, one for gemcitabine. Uh, we have more cases to discuss that are more controversial a little bit, and we'll touch more on, on this in the next few cases. Then the second case is a 56-year-old female with a history of breast cancer at the age of 32 and uh, presented with abdominal pain and weight loss. Uh, and scans again reveal stage 4 disease, uh, test line, testing for germline mutations, positive for BRCA2, performance status 1. Uh, and again, this is uh, not a question about maintenance. This is a question about upfront therapy for BRCA2 positive uh, patients. Uh, and we can see that the preponderance of the answers were in favor of GEMSYS uh, 13, uh, which would be the right uh, frontline therapy in BRCA positive uh, disease. Olaparib is an option, but it's usually main for maintenance therapy, uh, not in the upfront setting. And again, we have some more cases to discuss. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, highlight some more of these aspects uh, in the next few cases and uh, maybe some more in the question answer session. Uh, should we go to the uh, case presentations uh, at this point? While we wait for the case presentations to come up. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, OK, next slide, please. So I have selected a few cases from my practice. Uh, and of course, I've selected cases that are somewhat controversial so that uh, uh, we can have uh, some more lively debate. So it's not a uh, right or wrong answer. Uh, the first one is a 66-year-old male patient who presents with uh, uh, left upper quadrant and mid back pain, CT scan for the mass in the pancreas with no metastasis, biopsy positive for adenocarcinoma, no other medical history, uh, ECOG performance status is zero, uh, labs are within normal except the CA199, which is 423. Next slide. And uh, here we get uh, one, uh, one, one cut of the scan which shows uh, encasement of the SMV, uh, the SMA, the uh, common hepatic artery, and the celiac axis are free, uh, and uh, no uh, metastasis. Again, I'm not going to play the whole scan because uh, I was worried about technical uh, pro problems. So I'm going to open the debate a little bit and discuss uh, what should our next step be uh, in a patient who has very good performance status, uh, limited the disease to the pancreas with encasement of the SMV uh, and in CA99 of above 400. Uh, is this someone we would proceed with surgery directly or would we consider some sort of preoperative therapy? And uh, maybe I'll let uh, Dr. Mythel discuss that aspect and then I'll bring Tony in to discuss the specifics of the therapy that we would consider. So Shishir, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Basil. Um, yeah, so for this, you know, this is localized pancreas cancer, uh, but putting it into the three categories of localized versus borderline versus locally advanced, given the vein involvement, I think this would fall into the borderline resectable category. So I think there would be probably no, um, really no controversy in terms of preoperative chemotherapy or some sort of preoperative therapy for borderline. I think most people across the country would agree for preoperative therapy for the borderline category. I personally think even for the resectable category, given the natural history of this disease, I, in my own practice, uh, preoperatively treat nearly 100% of patients prior to taking to the operating room. And uh, in fact, we are trying to push more and more of a uh, longer duration of pre-op therapy and really pushing surgery to the back end, almost getting toward a TNT type approach. Um, so for this patient with a good performance status, you know, in our practice, if you and I were managing this, we would we would start with some full Ferenox and then restage in two to three months. Excellent. And uh, does the CA199 
play any part uh, i understand the aspect about it being borderline resectable how about the ca199 does a preoperative ca199 play any role in your decision about preoperative therapy yeah a hundred percent i think i mean again i think a high ci 99 really just confirms my decision to give preoperative therapy but even someone with a lower ca 99 i would still with a diagnosis of pancreas adenocarcinoma still favor one thing about interpreting the ca 99 you know i think you you said all the other labs were normal so mm -hmm. i would have Imagine that the patient's already been stented, and I didn't see a lot of ductal dilatation in the liver on that on that slice. So um, that's also something to consider. But someone with a CA99 in the thousands, uh, you know, I would never take to the operating room up front. Someone with a CA99 of 85, if there were other extenuating circumstances, maybe I could be pushed into it if there were some other reasons for some reason. Okay. Uh, Tony, uh, if we all agree on preoperative therapy, uh, I left there some choices for Phoenox, Gem, Paclitaxel, uh, some sort of chemo radiation or SBRT. Uh, of those options, or would you do additional molecular testing for this patient? Uh, of those options, which would be the one that you would tend to use in a patient like this? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and I agree, you know, with uh, with Shishir's uh, <clears throat> comments about moving this for ninety nine percent of the patients are uh, neoadjuvantly regardless of resectability and yeah this 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 actually got got us to coin the the term uh, advanced non-metastatic because we pretty much start the same for all of them um now the question of course is is so a obviously is not the standard in in our institute in our respective institutions the question is, you know, how about Olfernox versus gemcitabine, NAP, Paclitax, and I'll touch upon the radiation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, SWOC study 1505 actually suggested that uh, there's probably not much of a difference, but with a caveat. The caveat is, and that's in the clearly resectable. So we don't know about the borderline as much, although there were a few patients there, you know, there with borderline. Um, but, but there were also, you know, a short course of chemotherapy prior to going to resection, and this was clearly resectable. You know, I still tend more to, to go to, to gravitate towards Fulferinox because there's more data with Fulferinox in this setting than, than gemcitabine, NAPAC, Pitaxel, acknowledging, you know, that the results of the SWOC study are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, are... Uh, uh, are uh, are interesting, and I mean, there is there is a study from uh, you know our colleagues from Europe, from the Netherlands, pre op Pank, that suggested uh, something a little different actually. They worked with single agent gemcitabine uh, plus uh, followed by radi radiation, and they did show you know some benefit there. So I, I think you know it's probably a wash, but I would start with fulfirinox, uh, and only consider switching to gem nab in, in a patient like this uh, in case there is not. Um, as much of a response. We do additional testing. We do PET MRIs on all our patients. Uh, you know, we do follow the HUV on the on the, on the the tumor. We also, as Shishir mentioned, we follow CA99s. And this would be a decision for at least our practice to make a switch uh, to Gemnap Paclitaxel for those who don't optimally respond. So I'm finishing off just on the question of radiation. Uh, you know, ke chemo radiation, uh, upfront does not make sense. Of course, this is a systemic disease for most patients. So you start with systemic therapy. The question is, do we consolidate with chemotherapy and radiation? Uh, it's a clinical decision. I would go to Shishir. I would go to my surgeons and ask them if they if they think chemotherapy has done enough of a job to move forward with resection. Uh, for borderline resectable, it's a 50-50. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, again, it's a multidisciplinary decision, but if we decide to go with radiation, I would not do SBRT based on, on the results of the uh, recent uh, Alliance study that suggested, um, I wouldn't say detrimental role because uh, detrimental role because that wouldn't be incorrect, but, but at least no added benefit from SBRT. And, you know, the more you, you think about it, the more it makes sense. I mean, you know, Shishir is going to take care of the local piece. Uh, to to uh, to be concerned about just uh, you know a, a smaller uh, field 
to hit the area that you see is going to clean up really well doesn't make sense. And if we want to go with the radiation, you probably want a larger field uh, to include regional nodes and others. And that, that probably would be a better idea than with SBRT. There may be other issues as well. But overall, that, that would be the line of thinking from, from, from okay. our step. Next slide. I think you, we have follow up on the case and I'm glad you started us with the discussion about next stage. So uh, there was consensus on Forforinox at our tumor board. Uh, the patient uh, tolerated therapy well, uh, and we saw a reduction after two cycles in the CA199, uh, and the scan showed improvement uh, with the partial response, but still some interface with the SMV. Uh, so I'm gonna go quickly through this slide, and then we can spend time on the next one. Uh, I think. Uh, most probably consensus would be to try a little bit more chemo, right? Uh, the tumor marker coming down, the patient responding well, things are moving along just two cycles. We try more chemo, right? Two more cycles, agree. Next slide. So a cycle, just to be clear, a cycle is, you, you consider your cycle as two weeks, right? Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Two, two treatments. Two, two treatments. Yeah. Two treatments. So this patient already went through... Uh, Four treatments, two months. Treatments. Got it. Two months, yeah. Next no. slide. Ah, I, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> did we miss this? I think we missed this slide, but it's okay. Next slide. Uh, so next case. This one uh, more uh, along the line of hepatobiliary. 70-year-old uh, female patient presented with elevated liver function tests. Uh, they tried conservative management with no improvement. Uh, they checked hepatitis profile was negative. Then they decided to do a CT scan, abdomen, which showed an intrahepatic mass in the left lobe. Uh, biopsy adenocarcinoma compatible with cholangio. They had EGD and colonoscopy, which were negative. Uh, ECOG performance status one. Uh, the patient was taken directly to surgery. Uh, and the final path was a four by two centimeter cholangiocarcinoma, moderately differentiated, margins negative, and someone was very eager and ordered a mutational profile and cheese FGFR2 translocation. Next slide. So uh, I know, Shashir, you talked a little bit about uh, pre op management. Uh, so I want to put the case to discuss the what do we have to discuss adjuvant uh, therapy management in resective cholangiocarcinoma? Uh, should we at this point be thinking more observation? Uh, are we convinced with the BILCAP trial and are we recommending kisnitabine? Uh, there's still a rumbling in the background about platinum-based therapy in this uh, setting, uh, chemo radiation, or do we do an FGFR inhibitor? And I'm gonna give uh, uh, Mehmet, a chance to talk, and then maybe Tony, and then Shashir. Sure. Uh, thank, thank you, Bas. Start us with the observation versus therapy, and maybe we'll let Tony discuss which therapy. Sure. Uh, I mean, this is a sizable tumor, 2 versus 4 centimeter, in an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which is smaller, you could argue about observation. And this patient also has an FGFR uh, fusion, which may imply maybe some better prognosis. But um, with the two by four centimeter tumor based on uh, the, you know, at least the bill cap trial, I would consider um, at least talk to the patient about the pros and cons of uh, observation versus adjuvant chemotherapy. And there may be a role for considering some type of adjuvant therapy, which I will defer to the um, uh, next folks to discuss about but I mean if this was a smaller tumor I would have thought about observation more strongly but this is slightly larger than maybe I would feel comfortable although based on patient preference you could still argue about the role of observation especially the fact that we have the molecular data um, implying maybe more indolent disease. Tony, uh, what, what, how would you approach? Would you also give uh, option of observation or are you more on the treatment side? And then you can talk a little bit about the different treatment options. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I, and first of all, I, I would, I would 
second Shishir's thoughts about new, new, uh, moving to new management because you get you end up with a less of a discussion at the end of the day whether this is worth it for the patient or not, right? Because you have the tumor and you can observe whether it's going to respond or not to treatment. But for the adjuvant therapy, that's the challenge. You really don't know. Uh, you really don't know whether that patient really will benefit from chemo or not. However, as, as Mohammed mentioned, you know, the Bilcap study was uh, somewhat positive. And I'll, I'll say somewhat because, you know, the, there is some finagling at the, at the end. I, I mean, the, the, the delta is real uh, and, and, and likely there, there may be a slight benefit. Um, and it's unclear whether survival is really going to be affected more than relapse-free survival. That was frankly true with the Prodigy uh, study with the platinum based, where the delta was relatively similar for, for RFS, but the survival benefit was not there. Uh, you, the, 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 F, the presence of an FGFR translocation may actually predict for uh, a better uh, progno progno prognosis. And uh, even at least, you know, what we see in uh, studying some of. Uh, you know, our, our patients mostly respectively, that there may be less response to chemotherapy. So I, I you know, I, I think that, that that will require a, a really good discussion with the patient. Um, and, and I agree with Mehmed. I mean, I'm, I, 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 the, the size uh, is, is, you know, reasonably large to, con to be concerned about uh, recurrence. Um, at the same time, uh, like I said, you know, this ends up being a shared decision-making process, talking to the patient at length, whether, you know, there is, there is uh, you know, uh, across-the-board benefit. But if I had to pick chemotherapy, I'd probably go with capecitabine because that's, you know, where the best data, uh, frankly, uh, frankly is. Dr. Michael? Yeah, no, I think uh, all the points have really brought up. Um, I was I was honored to be part of the the group that wrote the ASCO adjuvant guidelines for this disease, and you know a lot of the people on that were actually the PIs of the BillCap trial and the Prodige uh, studies, and so we had really great discussions. Um, you know, despite as Tony said, BillCap kind of being our quote unquote best data. You know, the intent to treat analysis was technically a negative study by p-value criteria. And, you know, given the GEM platinum history with GEM cis and the protease results, I think there are many people across the world who still favor a GEM platinum regimen for this disease. So I think definitely needs some adjuvant therapy, um, you know, whether the recommendations say Cape Cytobine, but GEM cis is not wrong either. So we kind of hedged on that a little bit. I think the use of FGFR2 inhibitors, we just do not have data for that in the adjuvant setting. They, there are studies being contemplated and being proposed uh, in this setting, in the adjuvant setting, but they are, it's gonna be a you know, challenge to deal with the feasibility and the numbers and, and all the, the logistics that come down to adjuvant studies. Um, and hence, um, you know, as, as I was saying in my talk and as Tony had alluded to, the new adjuvant approach utilizing these and getting this data up front, I think is really gonna be the forward approach, hopefully, you know, in the future as we go forward. Okay. And, you know, if I if I may, there is there is a and I, I'm not opposed to gem platinum. I think it's a very reasonable uh, option as well. Um, one thing about this disease, this is unlike pancreas. This is not a systemic disease. This is more uh, a field defect, and you 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 the most of the recurrences are local, not local at the site of resection, but it could be in other parts of the liver. Um, which is one of the challenges about uh, the the adjuvant piece and making a difference on the long run. I think that's that's where biologics would make sense to look at because biologics, you know, target the biology. Chemotherapy uh, does not as much. Exactly. Uh, so I'm excited. I know Shishir, you know, has been quite involved uh, and others as well. So I'm I'm quite excited, you know, about moving some of these biologic agents. Uh, uh, properly into the new adjuvant uh, slash adjuvant or perioperative setting. I would just want to add one real thing, Basil. You know, this was four by two. So if you look at a lot of the poor prognostic factors, this is sub five centimeter tumor. So theoretically, it's actually, you know, I know it's a four centimeter tumor, but for an intrapatic clangio, it's actually relatively on the smaller end, to be honest. Yeah. And then the one, the one thing I would also comment on option D there. I don't think there's much role for radiation in the resectable intrahepatic cholangio situation. 
as opposed to the distal cholangio and hilar cholangio, which is you know where the SWOG 0809 data comes in. But for the intrahepatic, I don't think there's much of a role for radiation, particularly in a margin of negative resection. Excellent. I think we have consensus here, uh, leaning towards chemotherapy adjuvantly, uh, and feeling that CAPE or platinum-based gem platinum would be either would be an acceptable option. Let's go try to do one more case uh, before the time before the time is up. Next slide. Next slide. So this is a 58-year-old uh, patient with uh, chronic compensated cirrhosis, Charles PUA, presents with elevated alpha fetoprotein on routine blood tests. MRI reveals more than multiple, more than five bilobar hepatic masses, with the largest being 6.2 centimeters. Uh, masses enhance show typical features of uh, HCC, no extra hepatic disease, uh, no local vascular invasion. Uh, ECOT performance status zero, uh, BCLC determined to be B because of the multinodular disease, uh, PPSA, and performance status of zero. Next. So, um, wanted to discuss uh, number one uh, is there a surgical approach in someone who has multifocal disease of this nature and then second question to discuss unfortunately we don't have AR with us on the panel but second question to discuss uh, is bclcb still uh, purely an ir therapy or is there room for us to start thinking about systemic therapy so i let uh, shishir uh, we have a few more minutes left, so we have to be brief. I'm sorry, but uh, I'll let you share, go with the surgical question and then Mehmet and Tony to comment on the IR versus medical therapy for these cases. Yeah, and I think this, this is a great question because I think it really comes down to IR versus medical for these patients. But very briefly, there's by, by the book, there's no role for transplant or resection in this patient with five lesions with the greatest measuring 6.5. They're theoretically out of Milan criteria. Without, without a discussion of downstaging, I think A and B are not good options. And so I'll leave the time for um, my two my two colleagues to discuss uh, C, D, and E. So who's gonna go first, uh, Mehmet or Tony? Let Mehmet go first and then Tony. Sure. Yeah, Mehmet, go ahead. Thank you so much, Tony. So this is indeed a great uh, case and it, it comes down to IR versus medical oncology. In the absence of highly effective systemic therapies, one could argue to start with liver direct therapy and then see if you could try the available systemic therapy. But we are not there now. We do have highly effective systemic therapies. And even though this is a BCLC B stage, no vascular invasion, no extra hepatic disease, with a with a, a therapy that is highly effective like atezolizumab and bevacizumab with you know response rate of 27% objective response rate and disease control rate of 80%, I would highly encourage to start with systemic therapy in this case. And I also should mention that even if you go with liver-directed therapy, this is bilobar disease and they would need to do it piece by piece. And that's going to, I think, cause a significant delay in terms of starting the highly effective systemic therapy. So in brief, I would highly recommend starting with the systemic therapy and also keep in mind other therapies down the line. But I think the most benefit would come from the systemic therapy with a the potential to downstage with this active therapy and then consider about other, you know, uh, more definitive therapies because there is no extra hepatic disease. Tony, we're yeah. short on time, but uh, I do want you to weigh in on this controversial. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be. It's 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 not controversial if you're an interventional radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we don't have them on the panel. <laughs> no, but, but you know, I think I think uh, I think Mehmed hit it right on. We have, and the updated response rate is actually more than thirty percent now. So we know that this is a highly effective therapy. It's actually, again, a multidisciplinary approach. I want Shishir to be in the discussion or the intervention radiologist to be in the discussion. And, 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 and it would make most sense for this one to actually, as Mehmed mentioned, to have Atizo Bev first, you know, bring down this to, uh, to, to uh, a, a, a more manageable tumor locally. And then you can certainly, not discounting the importance of these catheter-directed therapies, 
then you can consider them and you're more likely to make a bigger difference in those patients by using this approach rather than just you know go directly to to ir okay i think uh, we are up on time uh, i would like to thank the panel for the excellent talks and the very high level discussion of these controversial cases and i would like uh, to invite everybody to visit uh, uh, our sponsors and uh, uh, the people who make this uh, conference possible uh, so please take some time to visit the exhibit room uh, and we'll see you in the afternoon session thank you thank you everyone appreciate the invitation thank you so much thank you bye bye Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alachinji Ali Shane, and um, on behalf of the uh, my fellow co uh, course directors, I welcome you all once again. Thanks for joining us. I'll be talking about immunotherapy in gastroesophageal uh, cancers. Uh, are we there yet? Uh, these are my disclosures. So the learning objectives are to discuss the molecular characteristics of uh, gastric and gastroesophageal malignancies while highlighting the current treatment strategies and also to demonstrate the role of immunotherapy and biomarkers uh, in the clinical management of these malignancies. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, gastric cancers account uh, for the third leading cause of cancer mortality. Uh, 2018 alone, uh, more than 780,000 uh, people died from the disease. And the American Cancer Society estimates that uh, more than 26,500 patients uh, will be diagnosed in the U.S. Uh, with a gender uh, disparity occurring more in men and the same uh, disparity they see in the, uh, the more than 11,000 estimated uh, mortalities. Uh, the average age of onset is 68 years and about a third rise uh, in the proximal stomach, uh, which accounts for most of the rise in incidence. Uh, this uh, elegantly uh, designed study was published in Nature almost seven years ago uh, using several platforms. Uh, the authors were able to show that uh, Gastric cancer or gastroesophageal tumors can be roughly subdivided into four categories. Uh, of note is the microsatellite high disease, uh, which will feature prominently in the rest of this presentation. Uh, but suffice to note that the EBV positive, uh, genomically stable, and the chromosomal unstable are the uh, three other broad categories. Uh, Dr. Ajani uh, published this uh, review uh, in Nature Reviews Disease Paramounts back in June of 2017. And comparing those four categories uh, with the study that was done in Asia, uh, microsatellite stable uh, P53 intact uh, phenotype appeared to mirror that of the EBV uh, positive. Uh, TCGA cohort. Uh, the microsatellite high were about the same in both studies, uh, while the genomically stable uh, mirrored the microsatellite stable uh, epithelial mesenchymal trans uh, transitional subtype, which has the worst prognosis. Uh, it's typically diffuse and uh, has uh, loss of the CDH1 mutation. Uh, the broad category uh, occurring about one in two. Uh, are the uh, microsatellite stable uh, TP53 uh, mutated uh, phenotype. Uh, immunotherapy in gastroesophageal cancer can be broadly categorized into two, passive and active. Uh, most of the monoclonal antibodies currently in clinical practice are uh, actually passive immunotherapy, and uh, the non-specific uh, immunotherapy using checkpoint inhibitors are really the ones that gain a lot of traction. Uh, suffice to note that there's been a lot of uh, efforts uh, using cancer vaccines, but have not really panned out. Uh, this cartoon shows the various uh, phases of immune uh, involvement with gastric uh, cancer, and uh, the priming activation killing of cancer cells using 
uh, type PD-1, pd one have been the ones that have been most effective. Uh, in the pre or perioperative treatment setting, uh, Checkmate 577, a global phase three a randomized trial was really the one that has changed practice. Uh, patients with uh, stages two or three esophageal uh, or gastroesophageal junctional tumor who were treated with chemo radiation in the neoadjuvant setting using the cross uh, regimen were uh, subsequently treated with surgical resection. And for those who had residual pathologic disease, uh, following an R0 resection were randomized two to one to receiving either nivolumab or placebo. Uh, the baseline characteristics show that patients were pretty well balanced between the interventional and the control arm. And uh, the disease-free survivor was in favor of patients who received nivolumab uh, with a median uh, DFS of 22.4 months compared to 11 uh, for those who got placebo. And the subgroup analysis, our uh, first plot showed uh, a trend favoring nivolumab across the different uh, stratification. Uh, the patients uh, separated out early and the survival benefit persisted for those who got nivolumab. And the safety summary table did not really show anything new uh, compared to what we've always known with the use of immunotherapy. And this has uh, changed practice. Uh, the ECOG Acrin 2174 uh, phase two study of perioperative nivolumab and ipilimumab is currently enrolling at Emory. Uh, patients are randomized to receive either the carboplatin or taxol radiation or with the addition of nivolumab. And uh, following esophagectomy, patients are further randomized to receiving other single agent nivolumab or nivolumab with ipilimumab. Uh, the primary objectives are path CR rates and disease-free survivor, uh, but there are also some other interesting secondary and imaging objectives. Uh, the second uh, trial in this space that is also currently enrolling at Emory is the Matahon. Uh, this is a randomized double-blind uh, phase three study of neoadjuvants, duvalumab, and flot chemotherapy. So the ECOG uh, trial is for esophageal and gastroesophageal, why right? this is for gastroesophageal and gastric cancer. And patients are uh, randomized one to one to receiving either the standard of care flux uh, with uh, duvalumab or placebo uh, treated uh, for a total of a year. Uh, moving quickly to the metastatic or unresectable disease space, uh, the first line setting uh, was uh, shown uh, based on the Keynote 062 using pembrolizumab uh, to be effective. Uh, patients who received either pembrolizumab, pembrolizumab with chemotherapy or chemotherapy were shown to be well balanced between the three arms. And uh, using a cutoff of CPS score one or greater, there really wasn't a lot of difference uh, between the pembrolizumab and the chemo arm. But patients who have CPS 10 or greater were shown in the Kaplemeier curve in the bottom right uh, to have a survival advantage uh, with the hazard ratio of 0.69 and a median uh, overall survival of 17.4 months compared to just 10.8 for those who got chemotherapy only. The addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy did not make any difference. Uh, between CPS 1 or even when that was uh, further restricted to 10. And the conclusion from the trial is that a uh, patient with CPS score of 10 or greater uh, definitely have a survival advantage when they're given single agent pembrolizumab in the frontline setting. Uh, the Checkmate 649 was recently presented. Uh, patients were originally randomized one to one to one to receiving either nivolumab with ipilimumab, nivolumab with dealer's choice, uh, zeloda with oxaliplatin or folfox, or chemotherapy only. Uh, following interim analysis, uh, the immunotherapy only arm uh, was closed. And the primary endpoint of this trial was a dual overall survival and progression-free survival. 
uh, with PDL1 CPS5 or greater. Uh, the baseline characteristics show that patients were well balanced between the two arms. And the Kaplan-Meier curves in the bottom right uh, corner showed that the overall survivor uh, separated very early in favor of patients who received both immunotherapy and chemo. A median overall survival of 14.4 months compared to 11 for those who got chemotherapy only. Uh, the progression-free survivor uh, for those who received uh, CPO received a uh, immunochemotherapy combination, CPS5 or greater, uh, was the widest uh, compared to the different categorization. And uh, the overall survivor for those who had CPS1 was still in favor of nivolumab uh, containing arm um, 14 months compared to 11.3 for chemo only. And when all the patients uh, on trial uh, were assessed, uh, there was still a survival advantage for those who received nivolumab, 13.8 median survivor compared to 11.6 for chemo only. And this has led to the inclusion of the nivolumab with chemotherapy in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, moving quickly to the second line, it's mostly in the MSI high subtype that we've seen activity. And so this trial, small trial, uh, initially present uh, Initially published in the New England Journal in 2015, only one gastric cancer patient included, uh, but patients with mismatch repair deficient colorectal and non-colorectal cancers were found uh, to have remarkable response, uh, which was durable. Uh, the follow-up Keynote 158 study published in uh, JCO in 2019 confirmed these findings showing that the waterfall plot, uh, including more gastric cancer cases in this regard, about 24 patients, had a median PFS of 11 months uh, with a median overall survivor that had not been reached at the time of uh, study publication. In the third line setting, uh, the Keynote 012 trial uh, was really the one that showed the patients uh, with a PDL1 uh, one or greater uh, had a median overall survival of 11.4 months, uh, leading to the provisional approval, which was also reinforced uh, by another study I'm going to talk about uh, very quickly. Uh, comparing uh, patients who were enrolled in Asia with the rest of the world, there wasn't really much of a difference showing the global uh, adoption of uh, the efficacy that was shown. And uh, all the different uh, presentations of efficacy showed uh, that the overall response, uh, which was seen in about 22% of the patients, uh, was really durable. Uh, the Keynote 059 was the second trial, and this was uh, published in JAMA Oncology in 2018. Uh, patients who had been refractory to uh, frontline treatments uh, were enrolled, about 259, uh, to receiving pebrolizumab, and the disease control rate was about 27% in these patients. And uh, this led to the FDA approval of patients with PDL1, CPS1 or greater who have progressed on two lines of therapy. Uh, the waterfall plot uh, showed that even patients uh, with PDL1 negative disease benefited from it, but based on the uh, submission to the FDA, uh, the approval is restricted only to those with PDL1 positive disease. Uh, we have an ongoing FIDES 03 trial, uh, which uh, is a multi cohort uh, phase 1b2 trial, primarily looking at FGFR uh, genetic aberrations, but with an arm that enrolls patients to a combination of derazantinib and atezolizumab uh, for those with uh, FGFR fusion amplification or uh, mutated uh, gastric adenoma. Uh, in the second line setting. 
Uh, so in conclusion, current treatment options are increasing with the role of immunotherapy and relevant biomarkers. And understanding the molecular profile of gastric cancer is really crucial to improving outcomes. Uh, we currently have a well-established role uh, for the adjuvant setting uh, in those with esophageal and gastroesophageal junctional tumors. And in the first, second, and third, and subsequent lines of therapy uh, for those with advanced or metastatic disease. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll be taking questions at the end of this session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Preetesh Patel. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Winship Cancer Institute. Today, I'll be discussing what's new in anal cancer. So the agenda for today is to go through some background, uh, evaluate uh, the level one evidence uh, that sets the standard of care. Um, we'll talk then about personalized therapies and how uh, there are several ongoing trials um, looking at ways to either escalate or de-escalate therapy. And then I'll touch on proton therapy, which may be beneficial in special circumstances. So to begin with, uh, the staging system has changed uh, in anal cancer in the eighth edition uh, T-stage has not changed. This continues to be um, based on uh, the primary tumor size. The end stage, however, has changed. Um, instead of N1 and N2 and N3 um, stages uh, in the seventh edition, uh, now all of this has been combined into N1. Uh, N1, A, B, and C is assigned based on the lymph node basins that are, in, that are involved, um, as, as noted here. In addition, uh, there has been a change in the stage grouping. Uh, so uh, in particular, stage two has now been split into 2A and 2B. Uh, and stage three was split into uh, 3A, B, and C uh, compared to um, more collapsed staging in, uh, in the seventh edition as seen here. So this is just important to note as, uh, as we go through um, clinical trials, uh, certainly the, the, the eighth edition staging is, is typically not used in the older studies. So the timeline for anal cancer really starts um, with Dr. Nigro's first publication in 1973. Uh, this is the first report of three patients uh, who had received uh, concurrent chemotherapy and radiation. The radiation dose was only 30 gray. The chemotherapy was 5-FU and mitomycin. And of these three patients who underwent APR, all three had a pathologic complete response. Uh, this was, of course, very provocative at the time. Uh, suggesting the possibility of organ preservation in anal cancer. Dr. Nigro went on to publish a few more times on uh, his experience, the latest being in 1985, where 45 patients were reported upon, 84% ended up with negative biopsies after induction, and 89% survived with a median of 50 months follow-up. Thereafter, in 1989, uh, the RTOG is, should be commended for uh, completing a, a multi-institutional study evaluating a similar paradigm, 40.8 gray of uh, radi radiation with concurrent 5-FU and mitomycin, uh, was tested in 79 patients with anal cancer. Uh, this study showed 10% positive biopsies after uh, chemo radiation and a three-year disease-free survival rate of 61%. Uh, so this uh, really set the stage for uh, organ preservation starting to become uh, the preferred treatment uh, in patients with anal cancer. So then in 1996, we had uh, the first large randomized study reported, uh, the UKCCCR published ACT-1. Uh, in this study, the primary endpoint was local failure, and patients uh, with locally advanced anal cancer were randomized either to radiation alone or radiation with concurrent 5-FU and mitomycin C. Uh, this was a, a locally advanced group, so 40% had T3 or T4 tumors, 20% node positive. Um, and in this study, we found a, a progression-free survival benefit, and that five-year disease-free survival was around 60%. Um, if the patients were alive with extended follow-up, um, in the chemoradiation arm, uh, only 11% colostomies were required uh, compared to 27% uh, uh, in the radiation alone arm. Uh, it should be noted that there was no difference in survival in this study. So um, then in 2008, um, the RTOG published uh, their experience of the trial 9811. 
Uh, this was a trial of uh, almost 650 patients. Again, a locally advanced group of uh, T3, T4, uh, roughly 40% and 30% node positive. And in this study, the patients were randomized to 5-FU and mitomycin concurrent with radiation versus an experimental arm of induction 5-FU cisplatin followed by concurrent 5-FU cisplatin and radiation. The radiation dose uh, was around 60 gray in this study. And this study showed that disease-free survival was 68, per, the five-year disease-free survival was 68% in the mitomycin arm compared to 58% in the cisplatin arm. Colostomy-free survival and overall survival were also better. And there was no, distant, no different in, in, in distant metastases. So this study uh, really set the standard of care uh, uh, where radiation uh, doses between 45 and 60 gray were given concurrently with 5-FU and mitomycin. And the five-year disease-free survival again was 68%. Of course, uh, there are criticisms to this study and the biggest one being that uh, the comparison was flawed. Uh, the cisplatin arm in this study uh, wa uh, was potentially hampered by the fact that induction chemotherapy was used. So the role of cisplatin was uh, still not clearly defined uh, after this study was, uh, was published. So then moving forward, um, in 2013, we have an update of the ACT-2 trial, uh, which better answers the question of uh, concurrent mitomycin versus concurrent cisplatin. So in this two-by-two two study, um, patients were randomized to either uh, concurrent uh, radiation with 5-FU mitomycin or 5-FU and cisplatin. And then they were randomized thereafter to observation or maintenance. And the maintenance was uh, cisplatin and 5-FU. It should be noted that the radiation dose in this arm uh, was relatively low at just 50.4 gray. Um, so this study showed uh, really no difference in any of the arms. Uh, and really what that means is that uh, concurrent uh, uh, 5-FU mitomycin appeared to be similar to concurrent mitomycin and cisplatin when given with 50.4 gray, again, in a study of locally advanced anal cancer. There was no difference in colostomy-free survival or progression-free survival. We did find that grade three and higher heme toxicity was worth, worse with mitomycin, 26% versus 16%. Uh, and uh, similar to other adjuvant chemotherapy experiences, only 44% of patients that were randomized to adjuvant uh, chemotherapy were able to complete the full course. So this study really set the stage uh, that uh, radiation, again, 50 to 60 gray, with concurrent either 5-FU and mitomycin or 5-FU and cisplatin appeared to be very similar. And the five-year disease-free survival in ACT-2 was very similar to what was seen in 9811, around 70%. The next study that was published, RTOG0529 in the same year, evaluated an advanced radiation technology, IMRT or intensity modulated radiation. This was a single arm study with a primary endpoint uh, looking at acute grade two or higher GI and GU toxicity compared to a historical comparator, which was RTOG 9811. On that primary endpoint, this study was negative. Uh, there was no difference in the grade two GI or GU toxicity of, uh, of IMRT in this study compared to the historical control in 9811. However, there were notable improvements um, uh, the grade three hematologic toxicity was much better uh, with IMRT, 73% versus 85%, potentially uh, suggesting that bone marrow sparing with radiation is important. The grade three GI toxicity was also improved, 21% versus 37%. And the grade three dermatologic toxicity was improved, 23% versus 49%. All of this led to fewer treatment delays uh, when compared again to a historical control, and we know that this is important, an important prognostic factor for ultimate disease control in this uh, in anal cancer, um, and the and the overall uh, disease control rates and five-year disease-free survival appeared again similar around seventy percent. So at this point, uh, looking across the timeline, since two thousand and thirteen, um, not too much has changed uh, compared to what we do today. So typically, we're giving fifty to sixty gray. We're using IMRT now. Uh, we do a stage-based treatment as defined in the RTOG 0529 study. So patients with T1 and T2N0 disease typically get a slightly lower radiation dose, 
50.4 gray. And those with more advanced disease get 54 gray. Uh, and typically, uh, we are standardly giving either 5-FU and mitomycin or 5-FU and cisplatin concurrently. The other things we've learned from these trials uh, is that chemoradiation certainly is favored over radiation alone. We see a progression-free and colostomy-free survival benefit in the ACT-1 study, as I mentioned. And ACT-2, I think, pretty clearly shows us that 5-FU mitomycin is similar to 5-FU and cisplatin as it relates to disease outcomes. We found that induction chemotherapy did not appear to be beneficial in RTOG 9811. And there's also another study, the ACCORD-03 randomized trial, which confirmed, again, that induction chemotherapy, 5-FU and cisplatin, did not appear to change disease outcomes. Maintenance chemotherapy was not beneficial in the ACT-2 study, and a higher radiation dose, up to 70 gray, was tested in ACCORD-03, and also did not really show an improvement in outcomes. We have seen, uh, similar to uh, the head and neck cancer squamous cell patients, that HPV-positive anal cancer, which is typically 90% of our patients, have a better disease-specific survival compared to HPV-negative patients. And then HIV patients are uh, often uh, found to have anal cancer. And there's some mixed data on what the outcomes are for HIV-positive versus HIV-negative patients. Uh, here's um, a systematic review published in 2019. Um, and this combines multiple experiences, which does suggest that HIV-positive patients have a worse five-year disease-free survival. In this case, the risk ratio was 1.32 when this group was compared to an HIV-negative population. So where we're going from here is we're trying to risk stratify. So patients with the best uh, tumor uh, disease characteristics uh, in RTOG 9811 were those that had tumors less than five centimeters in size and node negative. Uh, so that's the red line here. And those with the worst uh, disease characteristics, greater than five centimeter tumors and node positive is the yellow line. And here, disease-free survival at five years was really different between these groups. So five, uh, in, in the worst group, only 25% at five years compared to around 70% in the most favorable group. So this really begs the question, uh, should we really be offering a one size fits all treatment to patients uh, with these dis different disease characteristics? And certainly the answer there is no. So there are multiple now ongoing uh, randomized trials attempting to further personalize our therapies. So in the United States, ECOG Akron is running a trial 2182 called the DECREASE study. Uh, this is a study with a planned accrual of 252 patients, early stage, so T1, T2 patients that are less than four centimeters in size, N0 by PET and CT and MR. HIV positive patients are allowed. And this trial is randomizing to a standard treatment uh, with 5-FU and mitomycin and radiation to the standard dose of 50.4 gray, as I mentioned previously. And then the experimental arm will de-intensify the radiation. Uh, and as noted here, there's slightly lower dose for T1 and slightly higher for T2. And the nodes are also treated to lower doses. In addition, mitomycin will be de-escalated from 12 milligrams per meter squared down to 10 milligrams per meter squared. And instead of two cycles of continuous infusion 5-FU, one cycle will be given in an experimental arm. So this study was activated in November 2019. There are 23 patients accrued to date uh, the activation at Emory is pending. Um, the primary endpoints of this study are, are really co-primary endpoints, a two-year disease-free survival of 85% or better, and then a health-related quality of life endpoint is also included. Uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, ACT-4 is also ongoing, which is a very similar study with a planned accrual of 162 patients. These again are T1 and T2 patients with less than tumors that are less than four centimeters in size, N0, HIV positive is again allowed. And again, standard chemoradiation is going to be compared to a de-intensified de regimen, 50.4 gray in the standard arm, and the de-intensified uh, regimen includes 41.4 gray and 23 fractions. The chemotherapy is the same in both arms in this, in this study. And the primary endpoint is a three-year local regional failure endpoint. So, um, de-intensification for the best, uh, best uh, <clears throat> um, stages of disease uh, is something that we're all in, interested in. And, and again, uh, looking to our head and neck cancer colleagues, uh, we, this, this, is a, this is a question being asked in HPV positive 
head and neck cancer as well. So uh, I encourage everyone to um, try to enroll on the ECOG study. Uh, it is a, a rare patient population. And of course, uh, really a multi-institutional -institu study is the only way to get, uh, get this question answered. So on the flip side, um, for more advanced stages, ACT-5 now is also uh, an ongoing study uh, across the Atlantic. So planned accrual of 640 patients for <clears throat> T2, N1 to N3, or T3, T4 patients. So these patients are being randomized to a standard arm of 53.2 gray and 28 fractions. And then they're going to be compared uh, in sort of a seamless uh, pilot phase two and phase three trial where two comparator arms will be evaluated, a 58.8 gray arm and a 61.6 gray arm. Uh, the winner of those two arms will then uh, enter into a phase three comparison uh, with the standard, again, with uh, com uh, combined mitomycin and 5-FU. Um, so this is a, a large study. Uh, the phase three endpoint is a local regional failure at three years, uh, but an attempt to intensify treatment in patients with more advanced disease. Um, in, uh, in the U.S., um, we saw a, a publication of NCI 9673 in 2017, which evaluated nivolumab as the, in, as, uh, in the second line for, for anal cancer uh, with, with really impressive results uh, as seen here. So this led to uh, the ECOG-ACRIN 2165 phase three trial. Uh, these are patients uh, with locally advanced anal cancer who have completed chemoradiation for anal cancer to a minimum of 54 gray, they're gonna be randomized either to observation or adjuvant nivolumab for six months. Uh, it should be noted uh, that uh, in a similar uh, trial design in non-small cell lung cancer, in a trial called the Pacific trial, patients were found uh, in a post hoc analysis to have better survival if immunotherapy was started within two weeks uh, of the end of chemoradiation. Uh, and so it's important to try to enroll patients onto this study as soon as possible. Patients can actually be enrolled prior to chemoradiation or shortly thereafter. Um, so this is another important study uh, that we'll be hoping to uh, accrue to. And this is currently available uh, uh, in our clinics at Emory. So a few points on, on, anal, on proton therapy. Um, so proton therapy certainly can be used uh, in anal cancer. Uh, here's a comparison uh, between a proton treatment and a photon treatment uh, uh, on the right, uh, VMAT, which is a form of IMRT. Uh, when we look at these types of planning studies, we have a 20% reduction in the bone marrow, getting 30 gray, reduced dose to the external genitalia, and, and reduced dose to the small bowel. Um, so uh, better avoidance in particular uh, with proton therapy, which we hope will translate to better toxicity. So um, a single arm multicenter study of 100 patients was published. Um, in 2019, so this were 52% stage two and 32% stage three B, median tumor size of 2.7 centimeters. And progression-free survival was right around 80% in, in this group. Uh, again, this is a single arm study evaluating proton therapy. And so um, if you look back at uh, the, the, the former radiation technologies, uh, so RTOG 9811 was, uh, was a 3D technique and then RTOG 0529 was an IMRT technique. And if you compare those two experiences with uh, what we saw in this proton experience, we basically saw that the heme toxicity was significantly better with proton. Um, interestingly, uh, GI and derm toxicity was not different uh, comparing proton and IMRT. But a bone marrow sparing effect uh, seems to translate here into grade two and grade three heme toxicity, uh, which may be particularly important for at-risk populations like those with HIV or those that are immunosuppressed for other reasons. <clears throat> Here's one of those special situations, a kidney transplant. Kidney transplants are always in the pelvis and therefore <clears throat> are at significant risk of transplant dysfunction from radiation for anal cancer. So here's one of my patients where you see a very clear reduction in the exposure to that kidney there outlined in pink where the red arrows are. So um, any patients with a, with a pelvic transplant kidney, I think are really best served with proton therapy. In this case, we're able to, to reduce the average kidney radiation dose from 23 gray down to 4.5 gray with the use of proton therapy. So um, several ongoing randomized trials, um, uh, de-escalating and escalating the radiation based on stage um, that we'll eagerly await results from. And then proton therapy can be certainly beneficial 
uh, in, in special situations uh, where certainly a, a pelvic transplant kidney would be a, a, a very excellent indication for proton therapy. And again, those where heme toxicity is a concern, uh, potentially patients with, with HIV positive disease as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'll close. Um, thank you everyone for your attention. And I look forward uh, to questions in the live sessions. Thank you. Hi, and welcome um, to our debate, uh, second line of treatment for uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, PRT versus uh, TKI. My name is Joran Baum. I'm an assistant professor in nuclear medicine at Emory. I have here Dr. Walid Shahib with me. He will do the next presentation. Um, so I'll start my uh, presentation. So um, PRT, uh, before we start, that's uh, just for, to be clear, a peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. That's a relatively new treatment we are offering now. And we'll, um, we'll discuss that a little bit more in details. So a little bit background about neuroendocrine tumors uh, before we move forward. Um, so uh, neuroendocrine tumors can arise from Neuroendocrine cells uh, located anywhere uh, throughout the body. The primary gastrointestinal uh, are the pancreatic and the bowel, the carcinoids that we know. But there are other primary sites like pulmonary, thyroid, adrenal, such as uh, the pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas as well, and, and more. Um, what we've seen over the past few decades as is that there is increase in, uh, in prevalence of uh, the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and that's probably likely secondary to better uh, detection and, and diagnosis. Uh, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor um, account for about 10, one to 10% of the pancreatic neoplasm. And the median age of um, diagnosis is 60 years. Um, unfortunately, most of those patients uh, present uh, with metastatic disease. So our diagnostic tools um, uh, for neuroendocrine tumors are obviously the history and physical. We have the transaxial um, imaging, the CT and MRI. EGD and colonoscopy can be helpful uh, in some cases as well. We have the gallium-68 dotate PET-CT, which is replacing uh, the Otrio scan. Um, it's a relatively new PET agent that has much higher uh, resolution and sensitivity um, for uh, detection of uh, somatostatin receptors um, rich tumors. Uh, we have the serum tumor markers, uh, such as uh, chromoglanin A, and the 24-hour serine uh, 5-HIAA, which is a byproduct of the serotonin. And also we have the uh, F18, FDG, PET-CT, that is um, indicated for um, neurodegenerative tumors that are not well differentiated, they're poorly differentiated, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I keep mentioning some of the statin receptors. So why are those so important? Um, some of the statin receptors are overexpressed in about 80 to 100% uh, of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoids. And there are about five types of uh, some of the statin receptors. The most prevalent one in, in neuroendocrine tumors is the type two. And usually overexpression of some of the statin receptor results in positive dotate update for Octrio scan that we used to, um, to do. And it serves uh, both for diagnostic and therapeutic purpose, meaning that we can um, detect the disease but, and also treat it using the somatostatin receptors. So why it's uh, important to understand the, um, the degree of the differentiation of the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, the the well-differentiated 
are the one we are talking today for the PRT. Those um, have a low KI67 and they overexpress the somatocytin receptors. And that means that also they have a different pathway for therapy. And as the neuroendocrine tumors uh, become less um, differentiated and, become, and are more into the poorly differentiated area, they lose their uh, ability to express those somatostatin receptors. Um, but on the other hand, they are more FDG avid, which means um, they take more glucose versus uh, the uh, dodate. And again, those are two different uh, types of uh, diseases that are treated differently. Here's an example. On the bottom, you can see a dodatate uh, PET CT uh, with uh, the demonstrate the multiple liver lesions that are uh, avid. And on the upper uh, row, you can see that there. Um, this is a post lutathera scan. Um, we uh, we do a one week after the treatment. We scan the patients to confirm that and uh, those was delivered to the area we wanted to treat, and there is still ability. So um, this concept of theranostics, meaning um, first doing the diagnostic and then treating with the same receptors is uh, something that we are, uh, it's, uh, it's something we're very excited about. It's not new to us. We have been treating with iodine for many decades, and uh, we have MIBG, and now we're talking about the Dota tape and in the future, we are expecting more um, uh, agents like that. Uh, for example, the PSMA uh, for prostate cancer. So a little bit technical information about um, the, uh, the, the Lutathera. So it's a lutetium dodatate, uh, lutetium-177. It's a somatostatin peptide analog coupled with a metal ion complexing moiety, that's the DOTA part, uh, which is labeled to the lutetium-177. Um, and again, the lutetium-177 is a medium energy beta emitter uh, with max tissue penetration of about two uh, millimeter. Um, but it also has some gamma radiation, which allows us to, um, to image and also to do the symmetry if we want to um, increase the doses or, or adjust the doses based on the patient. Um, the half-life is about 6.7 days, and the treatment is 200 millicuries every eight weeks for a total of four doses. I'm going to show that on the next slide. Um, this is the treatment regimen. So once we confirm that the patient uh, has uh, dotated avid disease, um, and obviously there are other criteria, but that's the, the main one, um, we are going to treat with 200 millicuries of lutathera. This is an outpatient procedure. Uh, the patient comes to the uh, infusion center and uh, receives the infusions. Um, together with amino acid infusion that will protect the kidneys. Um, and basically, the patient uh, will, um, if there's no uh, any adverse event, will leave that day uh, back home. And then the next day, the patient will receive uh, a dose of uh, long-acting lenrirtide that usually they are already taking. So that's, uh, and we do that for four doses, eight weeks uh, apart. Um, and Sometimes we need to change the timing because um, the patient um, demonstrated a little bit uh, of uh, bone marrow suppression and we, we need to give the a little bit more time to recover. So here is a scheme of how we uh, actually do it. So on one arm, the patient will have, uh, will receive the amino acid solution. Um, and then on the other arm, you know, the patient will uh, get the uh, lutathera, the tissue 177 dotate, um, based with just a, a, a drip. Um, and the patient, again, uh, just sits and um, watch TV while um, um, they receive the treatment. The patients tolerate this pay, uh, treatment very well. Um, in the past, we used to have some issues with the nausea and vomiting. 
but um, now that we have the new amino acid solutions and the patients are tolerating very well and um, at least with our experience um, they they don't suffer uh, much from any uh, adverse events they usually tell us that they feel a bit tired a few days after work but um, Beside that, they usually tolerate well. So, um, Dr. Shaib will uh, discuss a little bit more uh, about the trials, but uh, this is the main trial, the Netter 1 trial, that um, kind of brought to uh, the approval here in the US of this treatment. So, the Netter 1, it was an international notice center. Um, study 41 centers, eight countries, and basically almost 230 patients were divided with well differentiated metastatic mid gut neuroendocrine tumors were divided in two arms. One arm received the lutetium dotate, and the other arm received uh, the long acting of uh, but double dose of the what they usually get. And this study demonstrated um, that. The uh, progression-free survival uh, was 8.4 months for the obturotide and for the um, uh, lutathera, um, it actually uh, never reached the uh, median. And the patients, um, the side effects were usually great. The, the worst um, side effects were grade 3 and 4 neutropenia thrombocytopenia and lymphopenia um, that occurred with uh, 1 and 2 and 9% of the uh, Lutathera uh, group. Here you can see the couple of um, curves and again you can see that uh, the uh, there's a good progression free survival uh, there's a good separation there as well with the uh, overall survival and it's still have been analyzed because it never reached the median. And here I will conclude uh, with the uh, NCCN guidelines. And um, I will just to show you that uh, for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, there are uh, many options out there, and there is no um, specific preference uh, into what uh, should be the treatment. Um, we're talking here first day they, they recommend to treat to start with octreotide whole and reotide and then uh, consider other uh, therapies and the prt over there is um is one of the, the options i believe that um from our experience um patients tolerate it very well not all not all patients respond to the therapy unfortunately but that's a whole new uh all other discussion uh, about why or what can we do about it. But overall, um, I think it's a very good option. Um, and we're very happy uh, that we have this uh, option to offer to the patients. Um, and uh, again, I think the overall, and that's from our experience, the overall um, safety um, profile is relatively good. Um, as compared to the uh, others that also are not, uh, that have all their own side effects as well. So, um, with that, I want to thank you. Uh, now, now uh, Dr. Shahib will uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for the invitation for this debate. Uh, it's an honor to debate Dr. Baum uh, from nuclear medicine. 
Um, so we're talking about second line therapy for uh, GEP nets, not only pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors, but all uh, GEPs. These are my disclosures. Uh, most importantly is that I'm not a politician. And the debate usually takes many forms. It could be political, and uh, we got a, a, our share from the political debates. It could be on grounds with people uh, uh, wanting something, and uh, it's either yes or no. Um, or it could be familiar between uh, the husband and the wife. Uh, more importantly, we try to reach an agreement at the end. And uh, why do we do a debate? Because we don't have an answer. Uh, and I like to post that I disagree with this one. I don't always debate people, but when I do, I win. Uh, I don't think there will be a winner uh, at this point, but I try to convince one way or the other. Uh, my stance is to discuss uh, 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 TKIs, uh, TKIs uh, in uh, second-line therapy for neuroendocrine tumors. So the debate guidelines, I found it uh, important to visit this website about uh, debate guidelines. And what they mention is first we have to put a strategy for our debate. As a first affirmative strategy is to discuss what are we debating. So we're debating uh, second line therapy, PRRT versus Everolimus or PRRT versus other TKIs or cytotoxic therapies uh, in the second line after progression on uh, octreotide analogs. The question here is, uh, this is from the Netter study inclusion uh, criteria. Do all patients or all, do all our patients fit into this criteria? And the answer to this is no. Uh, to start with, uh, patients above 18, yes. Uh, metastatic disease or locally advanced. Uh, locally advanced, not all of them fit into the criteria for PRRT, specifically with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or other uh, tumors uh, that are non-pancreatic. Uh, shall we give cytotoxic chemotherapy to try to decrease, uh, to try to have some response in order to change and uh, downgrade that, that tumor from an inoperable stage to an operable stage? Uh, histolo histologically proven is yes. Midgut is no, not all patients have midgut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, and this uh, trial only included midgut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, KI67 of less than uh, 20, uh, that is a no because we have some patients who have a KI7 of uh, more than 20, let's say 22 or 25 or 30. Are these eligible to get PRRT? Uh, according to this criteria, they, they weren't studied in the study. And then progressive disease, according to RESIST, uh, some patients uh, progress clinically. And uh, I mean, they have symptoms, they become more symptomatic, or uh, they become, uh, they will have uh, pain or pain from the primary disease. So uh, it's not only one size fits all uh, that we have to think about. It's, uh, it's what is the primary presentation and how can we help our patients. Furthermore, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, talk about the somatostatin receptor uh, positivity, like how do we define uh, positivity and what is our cutoff? Um, and more importantly, do all our patients have a performance status of more than 60? And then some patients have functional uh, tumors that will need other treatment uh, options. An example which is very relevant to this uh, debate is an insulinoma which we try to give uh, Everolimus for its side effect, which is uh, uh, hyperglycemia. So to start with is uh, we're excluding 20% uh, of our patients that do not fit the criteria for PRRT and we cannot treat them. And these 20% are non-FTG avid, uh, sorry, non-dotatate uh, uh, avid neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, the dotatate avidity is 80% uh, of neuroendocrine tumors. So the 20% are going to get uh, either TKI or uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, 
We know that uh, patients who have an octreo avid disease, they respond to octreotide analogs and they respond better than patients who uh, do, not, do not have an octreotide uh, avid uh, or octreoscan avid uh, uh, disease. Is this true for PRRT? And this is again from the Netter presentation uh, by Dr. Trostberg uh, in, at ASCO 2016. Uh, there is a scale, a score, uh, which is a Krennic score, and we don't have the answer that if the scale is graded less, are they going to respond less? Probably yes, but we don't have that evidence yet. We don't have it in uh, retrospectively, we don't have it in uh, prospectively. Uh, some studies have shown that the less, it, the less the avidity, the less the response. And this could be a biomarker that we need to choose down the line. Uh, I put this slide to try to convince myself, although I'm not convinced that uh, the serious adverse events are very high. And probably these serious adverse events are patients who were uh, admitted overnight or more than, like timing-wise, more than overnight. Uh, you see here that the group that got PRRT uh, had uh, nine events that had serious adverse uh, events, uh, as compared to one patient who had... Uh, uh, a serious adverse event in the double, doubling the dose of the uh, octreo, uh, of the octreotide analogs. Um, I can tell you from my experience that uh, this treatment is very well tolerated. Patients get home. Um, I rarely admitted admitted patients for even 24 hour observation uh, from any side effects. But we have to take into consideration also that uh, long term side effects include loss of renal function pancytopenia and uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, which is at a rate of less than 2%, but you have to take it into consideration specifically for patients who have other bone marrow diseases. Furthermore, uh, not all patients uh, received all four doses of the uh, PRRT. Uh, you see here, like, a majority of the patients received the four doses, which is well tolerated, but probably there was a delay from uh, bone marrow recovery uh, on, the, on subsequent cycles. And this is the gist of our debate, uh, what to choose first. Even on the Netter study, which is the study that Dr. Baum uh, supported as a second-line therapy for PRRT, nearly half of the patients uh, had undergone previous form of systemic therapy other than somatostatin analog therapy. 41% of patients in the PRRT arm and 45% of patients in the control arm. So what options do we have in the second line? We know from Radiant 3 study, which uh, enrolled patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, randomized to Everolimus versus placebo. Uh, these are non-functioning cancers, and they've shown a progression-free survival difference, which was statistically significant. In the Radiant 4 study, which has included a broader spectrum of patients who have other uh, neuroendocrine tumor primaries, including pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, lung, midgut, or any GI origin, Everolimus versus placebo has shown also progression-free survival difference. As shown here in this graph, and the Everolimus is approved for second-line therapy. Another uh, uh, target is the sunitinib, which has also proven uh, progression-free survival difference in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And this is also an approved therapy in second and third line therapies. More importantly, I bring this uh, target up, uh, which is the timozolomide plus, uh, cap uh, plus capacitabine. Uh, timozolomide mainly targets uh, MGMT uh, mutations and uh, 
there is some data that showed the higher that more deficiencies uh, there are for uh, MGMT, uh, the higher the responses. But here is a retrospective study, which is small, for patients uh, with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that have shown a response rate of 70%. And this was diluted for all other neuroendocrine tumors that CAPTAIN was used in, um, in it, and the response rate was reported at 40%. So that so far tells me not, not uh, any treatment is not one size fits all. Uh, we have to individualize the therapies and the thought process on what we need to use and why are we using it. I bring this uh, diagram uh, to tell you, or the schema, to tell you that uh, the PRRT was compared to high-dose uh, octreotide, which was not a standard of care and is not a standard of care. Uh, we have the everolimus, which has shown stand to be standard of care. We have sunitinib that has shown standard of care. Uh, but here to show you that we're not comparing uh, what we are discussing today, a PRRT versus everolimus but we're trying to analyze what we know from these data that we have at this time. Yes, the progression-free survival has shown uh, to be different between the two groups. But more importantly is uh, my concern is that are we delaying therapy with PRRT for patients by giving them uh, higher doses of the octreotide analogs. Of course, I cannot talk about are we delaying therapy from the everolimus perspective, but we have to keep in mind that patients, this is the survival curve and there is a gap in the survival. And this gap was also updated in 2018 uh, on the left-hand side uh, of this slide uh, to show you that it still carries a median overall survival benefit which tells me the earlier we treat with PRRT, the better our outcomes are. And we have to keep in mind that some of the patients who were on the control arm, they received PRRT in the second or third line therapy. And some of the patients who have received PRRT uh, have received Everolimus or uh, other TKIs in subsequent therapies. And uh, yet the overall survival is still different between these two groups, which kind of... Uh, helping Dr. Baum to prove his stance on starting PRRT early. Furthermore, the quality of life was even better after the multiple analyses on different uh, endpoints using the PRRT first. And here is a cost-effective analysis, uh, which has shown um, life uh, expectancy effectiveness of the two treatments. And it's, it's from Sweden and uh, Norway, comparing uh, uh, PRRT to Everolimus, which has shown uh, cost-effectiveness to start PRRT first. On the other side, there is a... Uh, safety data of using Everolimus or Sutent prior to PRRT. And the majority of these safety data are hematologic endpoints, which shows you that, yes, you can use Everolimus or uh, Sunitinib uh, prior to PRRT. So what do we have so far? We have the Netter trial that has shown PRRT versus uh, a higher dose of octreotide, which is not a standard of care. Uh, we have Everolimus as a standard of care. We have patients that were randomized in this study. 50% of them have already received other form of systemic therapy uh, in the Netter 1 trial, which is the PRRT study. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to use Everolimus or Sunitinib or other forms of uh, therapies. And it actually might be right but most importantly is the selection of patients. To answer this question, whether Everolimus uh, to start with in the second line therapy is better than PRRT, 
we need, of course, prospective studies. And there is a prospective study uh, which is called the COMPETE trial, which is enrolling patients uh, to answer this question. So as I told you, most importantly is patient selection. What is the aim of our therapy? Uh, is there a hormonal activity? Let's say it is an insulinoma. Are we able to go directly to PRRT or are we able to stagger Everolimus into the treatment with the PRRT, which we don't know how safe it is? Um, are we able to use Everolimus first? Is it better to use Everolimus or uh, Sutent uh, in pancreatic since the latter only included the uh, mid-gut uh, tumors. My stance on it is that if they light and we have this biomarker, which is basically the pet dotatate, if they have avidity or high avidity uh, uh, on the pet dotatate, probably they are going to respond better on the PRRT therapy. Uh, functional versus non-functional. Uh, these patients who have functional cancers, they might benefit from higher doses of uh, octreotide uh, analogs uh, to control their symptoms or short acting in addition to the long acting. So we really have to uh, personalize the treatment uh, to our patients. Then uh, the extent and the burden of disease, majority of it is the liver disease burden. And there are some studies that have shown, also there are retrospective studies that have shown the higher the burden in the liver, the lower the survival and the lower the benefit of the PRRT. Uh, of course, this is not uh, uh, defined yet, and uh, we, we're yet to define it. Uh, how about the pace of the disease growth? Uh, sometimes we see a well-differentiated cancer that is growing very fast and uh, 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 growing over uh, octreotide analogs within three or four months or six months. Uh, these uh, cancers have to ha tend to be more aggressive than... Uh, than the, reg than the regular well-differentiated cancers. And probably uh, uh, systemic therapies uh, with the cytotoxic chemotherapies might benefit these patients more than the PRRT. Of course, we don't have the answer for, and this might be um, a, 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 this, this pace of disease might be a biomarker uh, for patients who might benefit in the PR, uh, for the PRRT treatment. How about the grade? Uh, how about like, uh, 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 intermediate grade or patients who have a KI7 of uh, 10 to 20 versus patients who have a KI7 of less than 10. Uh, of course, this is not a WHO differentiation, but we don't have the answer for these patients that have uh, on the higher side of the uh, intermediate grade. What about the, the discordant features, the features that have a KI67 of more than 20, let's say 20 to 30 or, or, or 40, but they still have a well-differentiated cancer? Do we know much about the uh, PRRT effect if they have a pet dotatate ability? Uh, then the clinic scale. The clinic scale is uh, how avid the disease is as compared to the liver uptake. Uh, patients who have a lower scale are they going to benefit from the PRRT as compared to patients who have a higher scale? Um, what about the primary side that we talked about, pancreatic versus non-pancreatic, lung versus other neuroendocrine tumor? Although we're talking about the neuroendocrine tumor, the G, uh, GEP nets, uh, but what about the lung ones? What about the unknown primary? Uh, so we don't have answer for this. We talked about the liver disease burden. How about the prior Y90 and clogging the blood vessels that feed on the cancer? Uh, uh, is it going to deliver the PRRT, the lutetium to these cancers uh, uh, less and uh, less control in the liver if the patients had uh, liver-directed therapies? We talked about the primary cancers. What about the performance of the patient uh, or the other comorbidities? Uh, let's say they have a kidney failure. Do we know that uh, PRRT in kidney failure uh, uh, is safe? We, we still need more studies. Uh, how about uh, biliary uh, or the liver failure? Uh, do we know that if these are safe or not? Uh, what about patients who had uh, 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 liver transplant? And uh, is, it, is, the, is this treatment modality uh, uh, safe for these patients? So lots of unknown. Um, I personally feel that PRRT is a, is a very good option for majority of the patients, uh, but I also feel that patient selection is key, and it's very important to know uh, what our end goal will be with every treatment we choose. Thank you.
Hi there. Welcome to our final patient presentation and case discussion. Thanks for all that um, participated in our uh, pre and post questions. So the first pre question was, what is your preferred second line therapy in patients with well differentiated low to intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumors after progression of disease on somatostatin analogs? And three quarters of our respondents uh, said that they would uh, use PRRT for second line therapy in this situation. The second pre-symposium uh, um, questionnaire, what question was, do you think there is a role for adjuvant immunotherapy in patients with GE junction uh, cancers? And uh, similar uh, responses here, 75% uh, of our patients said yes, that they did think there was a role of, for adjuvant immunotherapy in patients with GE junction cancers. Do we have the post results? Okay, so maybe those are the post results. Okay, so we're gonna go into, I'm Marty Russell, I'm one of the surgical oncologists, and you guys have already met all of our speakers here today. We're going to go into um, some questions that were um, submitted uh, first, and then we'll do some case presentations. So um, the first question is, um, what do you give, why do you give octreotide the day after Luthera treatment? And is there any difference clinically between octreotide and lanreotide? And Dr. Baum, if you want to handle this one first, that'd be great. Dr. Baum, I think you're on mute. I can answer. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you, Walid. Okay, let me answer it. Uh, so this is how the study was, uh, was performed. Uh, sometimes uh, after PRRT, well, not, not sometimes, majority of the times when you target a receptor, you're afraid of uh, uh, more uh, like uh, loop pathway activation um, and you are exposing more receptors after the PRRT. Uh, that's why you use a long acting to block it. This is hypothetical, by the way. Uh, some, people, uh, some people in the field do not believe that we should give... Uh, we should give a long-acting uh, octreotide. Uh, it's an area of debate, but this is how the study was uh, was performed. But there, there is a, a there is a hypothesis of upregulation of the receptors. Okay, Dr. Baum, can you want to test your microphone again? I can't hear you. Maybe we is there a way we can work on that and we'll keep going. <laughs> Shelby, I don't know if you guys can help with that. Um, we'll go to, on to another question. Uh, what, so Dr. Alashe, maybe you can handle this one. What markers should we be testing for routinely for gastric cancer or G junction um, cancers? And for what do we do for primary? And is there a difference if patients have metastatic disease? Excellent question. Uh, so it, it's still an evolving field, uh, mostly based on a lot of the data that have been presented earlier today in other fields. Uh, but uh, what we know is that anyone with gastric cancer, especially uh, locally advanced or metastatic, should have the microsatellite status determined. And you need the PDL one based on approval uh, for the uh, different uh, immunotherapy or even uh, uh, cancer therapies in general. And so uh, with MSI high and uh, PDL1 done by immunohistochemistry, uh, sometimes for first line, uh, the argument is you really don't need a comprehensive next generation sequencing panel. 
And some of the payers actually would not uh, reimburse you for doing that uh, right at the beginning. Uh, however, on progression, now that we have the volume up with uh, chemotherapy, uh, hopefully to be approved in the next couple of months, uh, looking at alternatives, uh, you know, in terms of targeted therapy will require uh, comprehensive NGS testing. And uh, I think over time, uh, with the uh, more affordable uh, testing, uh, we may be able to incorporate this, you know, right at the beginning where we actually see the patient. Okay. And is there any difference in the in the studies that have been done for PDL one? Is there a difference in response rate? There's been variable information depending on tumor site for GE junction and gastric. Is there a difference in response rates that you can expect with different PDL one expression? So I think so. I think uh, check uh, the the uh, pembrolizumab uh, phase three trial showed. PDL one ten or greater are really the ones who benefit with frontline uh, immunotherapy compared to chemo. Uh, for nivolumab uh, checkmate six four nine, uh, the primary endpoint was for CPS five or greater. Although, uh, like I presented, even those with uh, one or greater also benefited you know, in terms of uh, the difference in survivor. So uh, it all depends on, you know, the CPS score to determine should you do it uh, chemo plus immunotherapy frontline, should you do immunotherapy only. And of course, uh, with nivolumab in a frontline setting, uh, there's going to be a lot of conversation about uh, the current FDA approval for Pembro in the third line setting. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shade, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, I agree. Uh, when there are two studies, there is the study with the CPS score of 10 or more. Uh, it was including only esophageal in the second line, which makes the uh, immune therapy approved in second line uh, uh, CPS score of more than eight esophageal cancers. But when they studied the immune therapy in gastric cancers, when they added it to Texol, the study was negative. So it seems the higher you go up with PDL1 expression, the better you are upfront therapy with PDL1 expression. Uh, clearly, for MSI, is different. Um, the expression of MSI is different between the gastric and the esophageal, like uh, percentage wise. And uh, for MSI patients, the earlier you treat with the immune therapy, the better we are in general, in all MSI. Huh? Okay. Dr. Patel, I know you spoke on anal um, cancers. I want to ask you a question about radiation. Is there any role, there's a, a question, is there any role for proton therapy? We're seeing it move into different sites. Is there any role for protons in esophageal cancer at this point? Or are we still, um, still holding that right now? Um, yeah, great question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, there, there's a, there was a randomized study completed at MD Anderson. So it was a single institution study of photon versus proton radiation. Um, and basically what we saw in patients that were resected was that the toxicity was much better um, in the proton arm. Um, so this was, uh, again, a single institution study with a toxicity endpoint. But it's now uh, led into an ongoing um, um, multi-institutional uh, multi phase three study of proton versus photon irradiation in uh, esophageal and GE junction cancers, which we have open. Um, and so for, for any, any of um, candidates who are um, patients who are candidates for this trial, we typically offer this trial. So really the benefit is, is just much, much better avoidance uh, of the heart and lungs in particular uh, when it comes to proton therapy. So uh, we're, you know, this, this is a study that's, that's looking at survival and we're, we're hopeful there's a survival benefit um, with, with this kind of avoidance. Excellent. Great to know. And then Dr. Baum, maybe, um, can we hear, you want to test? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. So, um, circle back to that question. Um, well, a uh, great question. So like Dr. Uh, Shahid said, uh, it was part of the netter. So that's, uh, why we are following those, uh, the same, um, um, uh, program. The, the idea I think is, um, 
although we are using the same um, receptors, the somatostatin receptors with the uh, PRT, um, the idea of uh, lenreotide or creotide is also to control the symptoms. So I think there was a concern that following the, uh, the treatment, patient will experience worsening of symptoms, and that's why they want to get the uh, uh, lenreotide following the treatment. So, um, and so the, the symptoms are going to be controlled. Um, we need to remember that uh, the PRT are four doses and they're separated eight weeks apart. So um, that's just basically continuing their lenreotide or creotide um, um, as usual. We just time it in a way that they'll get the PRT before and then the day after they get the, their shot, their monthly shot of uh, lenreotide. So I believe it's more about uh, symptom control. Okay, excellent. So we'll move into, we'll see how far we get. I don't want to keep you guys all afternoon, but we'll see how far we get with a couple of case scenarios. So I don't have any disclosures. So the first patient is a 71 year old male. He presented to his primary care provider complaining of a 35 pound weight loss in the last three months. He had progressive dysphagia where he went from solids to, to full liquids and now he can barely sneak down some clear liquids. Past medical history is significant only for hypertension. He had an epidemic at age 21. His, um, he's on menlodipine and metoprolol. He's married, a former smoker, uh, but quit several years ago. And he has an occasional alcoholic beverage. So he underwent an EGD. He had an esophageal mass at 30, 35 centimeters. It was nearly obstructing. And the pathology was invasive adenocarcinoma, intermediate to high grade. So he underwent an EUS, he had a T3 N0 tumor. And because of his profound weight loss and dysphagia, he went ahead and had a jejunal feeding tube placed um, pre-treatment. This is his initial PET scan. And as you can see, as we move down, very dilated esophagus uh, moving down into his tumor, which is FDG Abbott right there, just before we go into the junction of small hiatal hernia there. So what, uh, Dr. Alashe, what is his, um, what would you think would be his next option for, his first option for treatment? We have some chemo radiation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, trials, straight to surgery. What are your thoughts for this gentleman? I mean, uh, my, my first preference is always a trial. If the patient is a candidate to offer whatever is available. And in this instance, you know, the ECOVACRIN 2174, uh, would be a good option for him. Uh, other than that, chemo radiation uh, using the cross trial regimen uh, would be the standard of care for him. Excellent. And how do you how do you determine, Doctor Alashe, whether you go with FLOT, which is also known to have excellent response in esophageal adenocarcinoma? How do you decide FLOT versus chemo rads? Yeah. So the FLOT for trial as. Uh, presented and published by Dr. Albatran uh, was mostly gastric and gastroesophageal junctional adenocarcinoma. I mean, for this patient with tumor at 30 centimeters uh, from the incisor, uh, we will treat him uh, based on the original inclusion criteria for the cross trial, which were really uh, esophageal and uh, junctional. I mean, uh, it's likely to be sewage type one. Um, so my preference would be cross. Excellent. Okay, next slide. So thankfully um, we offered him trial and uh, he lived too far away. So he did not take us up on that. He did get uh, chemo radiation as per the cross trial. And as you can see here, his post uh, uh, chemo rads PET scan demonstrated a nice FDG response, um, no evidence of any distant disease, and you can see his esophageal dilation was uh, improved. So he underwent a three-field esophagectomy. He had an uneventful uh, recovery, and his final pathology revealed, the next slide, this is difficult to see, but basically he had a T4A N1 um, tumor. So pretty aggressive um, tumor. He had a, the reason he got a three field esophagectomy is his initial margin on his esophagus had some dysplasia and it ended up being invasive adenocarcinoma on the final. Uh, so we went to his neck 
and he got a three field and his final margin was negative with two of 24 lymph nodes that were positive. So what is next for this gentleman? Dr. Shaiba, if you wanna tell us your thoughts. And now uh, we have evidence of adjuvant therapy in this setting, uh, adjuvant Im immune therapy. And this is Checkmate uh, 577, as Dr. Alishay presented. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's over a year period that they get uh, immune therapy post, post, uh, chemo post uh, surgery. Okay. So this gentleman actually changed his mind about living too far away yeah. after his uh, resection. And so he did enroll in the trial that Dr. Alishay uh, mentioned earlier, the ECOG trial. And so he will be, uh, is coming up into wow. enrollment into that. Okay. Next patient is a 47 year old female. She's quite active. Uh, she started to get winded at the gym and complained of a, uh, some bloating. She has a past medical history that's significant for ulcerative colitis. She also has hypothyroidism and hypertension. Past surgical history is significant for a C-section times two, a colectomy, an ileostomy, a J-pouch, which she subsequently had reversed and went back to an endileostomy. She gets Synthroid, Welbutrin, and Amlodipine. Uh, her father has a history of pancreas mass, but it wasn't worked up because of his age. She is a teacher, has a, um, occasional alcohol, and does not smoke. In 2017, uh, before she presented to Emory, she had an acute episode of abdominal pain and had a CT demonstrating a liver replaced with tumor. There was a question of whether this was coming from a pancreatic tail mass, um, although that was never proven and it showed up on an MRI, but not on subsequent imaging. She had a coordinate biopsy of her, um, of her liver that showed a metastatic neuroendocrine uh, tumor, CDX2 positive. Um, it was, did have a KI67 of 11.4 and a mitotic rate of two uh, for high power field. So grade two neuroendocrine. She was started on the Lanreotide at an outside uh, facility and then came here with this uh, scan. So as you can see, a huge tumor burden in the liver. Um, all of that uh, is, is very abnormal liver with the exception of the left lateral sector there and a little bit in segment six. So very abnormal, uh, abnormal imaging. So do we agree um, with the initial treatment for this woman to put her on uh, Lanreotide and would we have handled anything differently here? We can start maybe with um, Dr. Shaib and then um, Dr. Balmuth, maybe you wanna give a comment after that. Oh, don't go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the patient is symptomatic, yes? Yes. So I think uh, we can go, we have three options here. Uh, one is uh, chemical, uh, ke some, give her some chemical response uh, since this is possibly pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor uh, or liver directed therapy to decrease the, um, the burden of the disease um, or surgery. If she's symptomatic, we can uh, uh, remove, we can do debulking surgery for uh, symptom management. But uh, for initial uh, treatment with lanreotide, if she is asymptomatic totally, like if we think that she's symptomatic from the disease uh, activity, let's say uh, she has flushing, she has diarrhea on top of her uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, then we have to start on the reotide uh, or, or, or any octreotide analogs. Okay, Dr. Baum, what about this patient for initial therapy? What are, you, what are you, your thoughts on her? So first of all, she's relatively young, so I would definitely uh, try to be more aggressive with uh, treatments. Um, so lanreotide, um, I think, at least in my opinion, it's not going to cut it. Uh, but um, I agree; um, it, it depends on on uh, whether we can do a liver directed uh, therapy with Y90s or other uh, methods. Or uh, the problem with the PRT, uh, first of all, she has grade two. And her endocrine tumor, so we'll need to do a, a, a dodatate scan, a PET scan, PET CT, and we'll see uh, if the disease is avid. And once it's avid, we can add that as an op as an option. Uh, but um, 
it seems like it's a really, you know, it's advanced disease, unfortunately, and uh, it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, the response again to, with the, the fact that it's a, a, a G2, um, it's, it's going to be limited. Okay. And speaking from a surgery perspective, unfortunately, her tumor is, is unresectable. It would leave her with very little liver. There's not really inflow outflow that could be preserved. So I don't think she was a surgical, um, a surgical candidate. And so, as you know from the um, slide, the next slide we can go ahead to. I want to I want to interrupt a little bit. Um, y ninety is uh, is not advised at all for patients specifically in her age. Uh, if we want to do PRRT next, it's going to cause more liver uh, issues as we go forward. Plus, she has uh, bulky disease in the liver. Uh, so the Y90 surely is, uh, is going to hurt her down the line. Uh, so I would surely not, not give her Y90. So when we're talking a little bit about sequencing, I think this is something that comes up in tumor board. Um, we used to, you know, before PRRT came on to, on to uh, mainstream, we were giving Y90 not infrequently to these uh, liver, um, either liver only or liver dominant disease. And so the questioning is, is a little bit of sequencing now. So giving the patient Y90 before PRT is probably not a good idea. What about PRT before Y90 if they progress later on? Are there thoughts on that? I don't think we have experience with that um, uh, unless it's anecdotal, but um, I agree. Uh, Y90, um, again, it depends how you plan it and how, how much you deliver and how many treatments you're doing um, can cause um, the normal liver uh, parenchyma uh, some damage. So that can be a, an issue as well. Um, in her case, uh, it's, the disease is so extensive in her liver that it's going um, to be very hard to deliver to a specific area. Um, so... Um, uh, my, I agree with Dr. Shaib. I think um, um, Y90 is going to be probably uh, not a, the first option here. Probably later on, if, if the disease is better controlled and then you can spare um, a lobe or something like that, you can uh, then you can uh, use the Y90 uh, for more uh, directed uh, therapy. Excellent. Okay, so the good news is, is we gave her some Temidar and Zalota, and she had an interval response. If we can bring up the next scan. So this is, oh, go back, let that run for just a second. You may have to click on it. There we go. So this is her interval scan, and you can see that her liver looks much more normal. She had a, a phenomenal response to the Zalota Temidar. Um, those lesions have pretty much shrunk away, much more um, liver, um, good liver parenchyma now. So I'm going to skip one step. So she continued on this for uh, some time, and then next slide. She unfortunately um, progressed. So we can show this. So this is your um, dotatate scan. And as you can see here, her liver has a lot more disease now than on that last CT scan. And unfortunately, when we get down to the pelvis, you're going to see that she has significant uh, bony metastasis along her, um, in her pelvis and in her spine. So what do we think? Uh, what do we think now, Doctor um, Alashe? What are your thoughts on next steps for her? Uh, so if I got the case right, uh, she started on lariotide and then moved on to Cape Term, mostly for uh, tumor debulking. And so uh, following progression on, you know, somebody who has already been exposed to somatostatin analog and chemotherapy. I think this would be a very good time uh, to be evaluated for PRRT, especially since the PET dota date looks uh, pretty good in terms of tissue ability. Okay, Dr. Baum, you think that she's a good candidate for PRRT at this point? Liver is not that huge bulky disease, definitely has a fair amount, but now she has uh, extra hepatic disease as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, 
as long as the color scale is a little bit, uh, it's hard to tell with, uh, with the scan, but um, um, like we um, mentioned before, if, if the, those lesions are uh, more evident than the background, that liver background, that's, that's a good indication that the patient will do uh, well with the PRT. And I believe, again, I think it, uh, the patients are tolerating uh, the, the treatment very well um, in most cases, and, and I think uh, it's a good timing uh, for her um, to get it. Okay. okay, excellent. So that's what she got. She got four rounds of PRRT, and this is her most recent imaging. And we're back to CT scan. Sorry, I keep toggling between different scans. But this is going to show the tremendous response in her liver. So you can hardly see any lesions now. I mean, if you, you know, compared to what she started with to almost a, a normal liver now, it's just phenomenal. Um, difficult to see on the scan. Her, um, her bony metastasis are stable um, but, um, and not progressing. So that's good news. That's great. And by the way, uh, there are new studies coming out now that we can uh, probably, uh, we can give another dose or two of PRT after completion of uh, the four uh, treatments. So uh, maybe uh, if she'll progress in the future, we'll be able to give her a um, couple more doses Excellent. if she responded so well, yeah. Excellent. All right, Dr. Patel, I didn't forget you. <laughs> Next patient. This is a 43-year-old male. He has a history of HIV, hepatitis B, hypertension, a PE, and a stroke. He was diagnosed with anal spleen back in 2017. Um, his only surgical history is multiple colonoscopies. He's on Eliquis for his PE, gabapentin, and his HIV medicines. He's um, a former smoker, does not use drugs, or have any alcohol history. Next slide. He um, received standard chemo radiation with 5-FU cisplatin radiation back in 2017 for his initial tumor. I want to ask a question um, to you guys because this comes up, you know, frequently at tumor boards, whether we treat these patients with um, 5-FU mitomycin or whether we treat them with cisplatin and 5-FU. And one of the group's thoughts on when you choose one over the other, does it is it just any HIV or does CD4 count matter? Um, what are y'all's thoughts on that? Dr. Uh, Alashay, if you wanna give us your thought first. Sure. So chemotherapy definitely matters, uh, mostly because of the uh, myelosuppressive effects of mitomycin. Uh, compared to cisplatin. I mean, when you combine mitomycin C with 5-fluorouracil, you know, sometimes the myelosuppression or neutropenia can be so profound that the patient is not able to get uh, the second infusion five weeks after, you know, the first treatment. And so for patients uh, with HIV CD4 count less than 200, traditionally, now, uh, we've preferred to use cisplatin in them mostly to reduce uh, the uh, possibility of infectious complications from the treatment. And Dr. Patel, you mentioned some trials that are talking about de-escalating and escalating radiation. Remind me, I know you mentioned it in your slides, remind me the HIV status for those trials. Are, are HIV positive patients allowed in those trials? And um, uh, does CD4 count matter? Is there any difference that we should be thinking about for radiation for these guys? Yeah, great question. Um, in the U.S. study, um, the, the, H the HIV patients are allowed, but they have to have a CD4 count uh, over 200. Um, and I believe that's I believe HIV is also allowed on the European studies, the ACT trials. Um, so um, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Jolinta Lin, is close to opening a trial at our Proton Center specifically for HIV positive patients. Um, so as I, sh as I showed in the slides uh, in a single arm uh, study from Harvard, um, the heme toxicity uh, from radiation was much, much improved with, uh, with proton, with just be basically better avoidance of the bone marrow. So um, this, is, this may be one of these special situations where, you know, again, avo avoidance of the unintended irradiation uh, with the use of proton 
um, could could make a clinical difference. Um, and so I think an HIV population really is is an ideal uh, place to test this hypothesis. So that that's what we're planning. Um, you know, when when Dr. Lynn's trial opens uh, at Emory, pro hopefully soon. Excellent. Thanks for that plug. Um, all right, next slide. So unfortunately, three years after uh, Nigro protocol, he developed another perianal lesion and um, was diagnosed with recurrence. And this is his initial PET scan for his recurrence. The upper part of his abdomen is negative, does not have any disease in his chest. Sorry, this is a little slow. When we get down to his groins, you're going to see a little bit of FGD, FDG avidity in his um, right greater than left groin. And then um, you'll see his perianal uh, or anal spleen. So there we have his tumor. So where do we go from here? So this is a gentleman that three or four years ago had standard Nigro protocol. Uh, Dr. Patel, any options for radiation in this, you know, do we re-irradiate this gentleman? Do we take him to surgery? Do we give him some more chemo? I'll start with you, Dr. Patel. Yeah, uh, you know, we, uh, I think a lot of cases get, get referred um, in this situation, unfortunate, an unfortunate situation. Um, I would say what, what I tell all the patients really is if um, if salvage surgery is is possible, that's that's always going to be you know my my first choice. Um, re irradiation, uh, you know, as as it, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone knows is is really tough. We're limited in what we can do, even with proton therapy, um, because most of these recurrences are are right in field, and uh, what you're irradiating has already received sort of a full a full dose. Um, so. In some cases, um, maybe a response um, is, uh, is we, we want some tumor response before a surgery. Um, to me, that's the ideal use of, of re-irradiation. Um, but if that's not the situation um, and there's no concern for, you know, for example, getting margins clear on, on radical salvage surgery, that's always the first thing I recommend. Okay. So not, um, not uncommon, he refused an APR um, as... I've had all of my patients that I treat um, with using it first, and they all want to be re-irradiated. So um, you guys were kind enough to give him some chemo, chemo radiation along with some Zolota from our medical oncology colleagues. And um, he came back, unfortunately, with this next scan. You can go ahead and go to the next one. Next slide. So this is an MRI that was done shortly after that. And as you can see, he has all of this tumor in his pelvis now. Maybe click it again. It needs got to go down a little bit further. There we go. And as you can see, he has soft tissue all along his right gluteus muscle with invasion there. And so he was presented at tumor board and um, is no longer a surgical candidate due to the inability to get negative margins on that. And so um, Dr. Alashe, Dr. Shaib, thoughts on additional treatment for him. Dr. Shaib, if you want to go first. Yeah, unfortunately, at this time, he, he needs chemotherapy. Well, well, the first line uh, metast in the metastatic setting, uh, carbotaxol is a reasonable uh, option. And uh, or or five FU cisplatin, uh, but we usually go with carbotaxol. Dr. Alashe, any other thoughts? So I agree with uh, Walid uh, that uh, with locally advanced or receptable recurrent tumor, uh, carbotaxol has been shown to be much better tolerated and yet equal in efficacy or at least comparable with the traditional cisplatin five FU. Uh, first line. Uh, but uh, we are beginning to uh, appreciate the role of immunotherapy. Uh, by now, you all know I'm a great believer in immunotherapy. And uh, there is an ongoing trial looking at uh, nivolumab with chemotherapy in the frontline setting 
or even just the EP level, uh, we'll see how that pans out. All right. Excellent. Well, I think that that brings us to the end of our uh, uh, 2021 GI Symposium. I would just like to thank all of the attendees for sharing your Saturday with us. I would like to thank all of our sponsors and, um, and of course, all of our presenters and participants. And I'll just remind you guys to be on the lookout for the 2021 when hopefully we can go back to seeing each other in person. Um, thanks to everyone, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.